we're about to begin. I would like all the panelists to come to the platform now. Good evening, everyone. I am Glenda Prescott of the Michael University College Alumni Association. At this time, I'm going to call upon the chaplain for the invocation. Good afternoon, everyone. Can I invite us all to stand for the prayer? Let us pray. Gracious God, our Heavenly Father, we come acknowledging your presence. We come acknowledging that you are our creator and that you have blessed us with the ability to create ourselves. And so, Lord God, for the ability to create artificial intelligence and its use in education and the general workforce, we thank you. We thank you for all the panelists who will seek to bring insight and understanding. Help us always to remember that things do not have any moral value of itself, but it's our use, our motives that make things right or wrong. So, Lord God, we ask you to open up our understanding. Let the discussion flow in such a way that each person is empowered. And may your name be glorified even as we seek to move forward in the new world of AI. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Members of the board of the Micro Foundation, custodians of Kingston and St. Andrew, executive of the Micro University College Alumni Association, members of MOSA, our esteemed panelists, distinguished guests, fellow alumni, friends. Good afternoon and a warm welcome to each one gathered here today. Your presence suggests that you are aware of the importance of this emerging phenomenon in this era. It is truly heartening to see such a vibrant and esteemed assembly, especially those of you who have taken precious time out of your busy schedule 
to grace this occasion with your presence. Your presence here today underscores the importance of the AI in education that will prepare us for an AI-enabled workforce. First and foremost, I would like to extend my deepest gratitude to our presenters who are pre presented locally and abroad. Also, our distinguished guests from the colleges for joining us today. It is indeed a privilege to welcome you this evening to this evening's presentation on artificial intelligence in education. This is one of the events of our week-long celebration of MOSA Week 2024. We began with an annual church service on Sunday, followed by our scholarship awards yesterday, where we awarded nine scholarships. We also awarded a legacy research grant, which was born out of our MOSA centennial celebration. There will be a Students' Development Day activity tomorrow, where the students will be involved in workshops relating to preparing for the world of work. They'll be discussing strategies for handling the myriads of problems that we may face. In addition, there will be representatives from the public and private sector who will be on site to offer products and services that they should be aware of. A big part of tomorrow's celebration is Jamaica Day, being celebrated here at the Michael. We will be having a musical fair and exhibition of what makes us a great nation. The last day of activity is Friday, and it's Alumni Link Up Day, filled with fun, games, music, food, interaction, dancing between students and alumni. We urge you to participate in the activities for the rest of the week. We are grateful for your continued support. I know you are anxiously awaiting the start of the AI presentation. So without further ado, I leave you in the capable, I leave you in the capable hands of Dr. Venice Leon the moderator for the evening. She is the director for online learning at the MICO and has combined career in education, social work, and instructional technology. Dr. Leon has a strong background in community service and is passionate about coaching. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Leon. Good afternoon, everyone. I am going to be using the protocols that were established already by Dr. Prescott. It is my pleasure to be here with you this afternoon to share in this very important discussion. The theme across the globe is artificial intelligence and its impact on our lives. There are so many misconceptions that exist, and we are here this afternoon to have a discussion that I believe will benefit all of us, especially because we are an educational institution. The theme suggests that artificial intelligence in education will assist us to be prepared for the workforce of tomorrow. No, artificial intelligence has the potential to address some of the biggest challenges in education today, according to UNESCO. It says that the artificial intelligence will be able to innovate teaching and learning practices and accelerate our progress towards many of the goals that we have for education. Now, can I see by the raise of hands of those persons who are anticipating this great phenomenon 
of artificial intelligence in our spaces. You're excited. You can't wait to see what tomorrow will bring. All right. Okay. So there is some trepidation. Let me see the hands of those persons who you have some concerns. <laughs> All right. And we have some very capable persons this afternoon who will be assisting us to address some of the concerns that we might have or to en entice us even more to look forward to what the future brings. I'm going to share with you the profile of the panelists so that you have an idea of the persons that will be sharing with you and what they bring to the table. To my immediate right, we have Mr. Christopher Record. <laughs> Yes, we have Mr. Christopher Record, and he's a technology entrepreneur, wine enthusiast, foodie, and lifelonger learner. Christopher is co-author of the recently published book titled Successful Digital Transformation, Your World, Your Business, Your Life. Reimagined. Christopher, whose first job was that of a teacher, has been an executive cybersecurity and IT provider firm for almost 40 years. He's currently offering consulting services, helping organizations grow and scale exponentially by implementing a customized business blueprint and a transformation system. For public service, Chris serves as several board and committee, serves on several boards and committees for businesses and the government of Jamaica, including the recently formed National Artificial Intelligence Task Force, where he serves as chairman and the Data Protection Oversight Committee. For fun, his love for business, his love for the business of wine has seen him become the leading voice on the topic of wine in Jamaica conducting regular wine education and entertainment events, and publishing over 500 articles on the topic of wine. Put your hands together and help me welcome Christopher Record. I want to pause at this time and also welcome our viewers online and members of our panel as well. On our panel, we have Dr. Damian Black. He is the Commissioner and CEO at JTEC. I'll share with you. Dr. Black serves as Commissioner and Chief Executive Officer with the Jamaica Tertiary Education Commission. During his career in higher education, he previously held positions with the University Council of Jamaica, University College of the Caribbean, Jamaica Theological Seminary, and Portmore Community College. He has worked primarily in academia and administration and leadership in other organizations. In addition to his current service with Jamaica Tertiary Education Commission, he contributes to the development of regional and global tertiary education policy and systems through his role as president, governing board of UNESCO's Institute for Higher Education in Latin America and the Caribbean. He was Jamaican's representative during the development of two major international conventions 
on the recognition of higher education qualifications. His professional education is from a number of institutions, including Jamaica Theological Seminary, University of Technology, Management Institute for National Development, Columbia Theological Seminary, and Eastern Mennonite University. Dr. Black is online, and I'm going to ask you to just put your hands together and make him welcome. <laughs> to my far right, I'm going to be introducing Mr. Tashfeen Ahmad. Tashfeen Ahmad is a highly accomplished professional and educator with over 10 years of experience in university planning. He has presented his research at academic conferences in more than 15 countries and his lecturing experience spans over 10 countries. He holds a Master's in Management from the United Kingdom, an MBA in Banking and Finance, a BA in Journalism, Economies and Statistics from the University of Punjab, and Diploma in Computer Science from the University of Cambridge. He has also expanded his knowledge in psychology from the Harvard University. His teaching in the field of artificial intelligence is exemplary, known for skillfully relating complex AI con concepts to real world applications. Mr. Ahmad's approach to education is celebrated for its effectiveness in diverse educational settings, leveraging his extensive academic and professional background. Please help me welcome Mr. Ahmad. We have online Mrs. Gillian, Dr. Gillian Hugh. Dr. Hugh is a lecturer in the Neuroscience and Behavioral Biology program and director of the new neuroethics minor at Emory College of Arts and Science. Dr. Hugh is actively engaged in neuroscience outreach, ethical education of scientists, and has developed curricula to promote science literacy and ethical engagements at various educational levels. She is the unit leader of neuroscience in the Emory Tibet Science Initiative and the director of the JOS Neuroethics Lab, a neuroethics and neuroscience pedagogy laboratory to foster inclusive neuroscience. She is a senior faculty fellow in the Center for Ethics at Emory University and is the executive manager, managing editor at the American Journal, Journal of Bioethics Neuroscience. Dr. Hugh ha, was selected a recipient of the 2021 Society for Neuroscience Award for Education in Neuroscience. Dr. Hugh is online with us. I'm going to ask you to make her welcome. Okay, so we are definitely in capable hands this afternoon, and I am sure you are excited about what you are going to be participating in. We're going to be having our panelists present, and we will take two members of our panel. They will share with us. We will accommodate questions and answers and then we will continue with our discussion. At this time, it gives me great privilege 
to invite Mr. Ahmad, IA researcher and instructor, to do an overview of AI in education for us. Make him welcome, please. Thank you very much for a uh, warm welcome. Uh, first time at your university. Uh, very beautiful campus. Uh, liked it. So uh, when uh, our moderator asked the question that um, how many of you are anticipating increasing role of artificial intelligence, not many uh, friends raised their hands. But when you are spending all night watching TikTok, when you are spending a lot of time on your Instagram feed, when you are watching one YouTube video after another, basically you are playing in the hands of weak artificial intelligence, which is playing with your minds. It has taken over you, that is why you are watching one thing after another. So you are without knowing, and that's the thing. We don't even realize what we are doing and we are just spending our very precious time on these type of activities which are in the background run by weak AI. I'm not, we are not even going to touch on strong AI. Very weak, limited, introductory artificial intelligence that is. Yeah, so that is one thing I wanted to say. Next thing, uh, um, when our moderator asked the question that uh, how many of you are scared about artificial intelligence, a lot of people raise their hands. So yes, so now we're Basically, it's misconceptions about AI, which are not 100% false, but they need to be viewed with a different lens. And that is why all of us are here and we are trying to take off, their, uh, take off, take off your misconceptions and try to introduce you to uh, the concept of embracing artificial intelligence. The year before COVID, 2019, I got a chance to go to Hong Kong. And my friends took me to a restaurant. So here is the restaurant. I am there with my two other friends. We press a button. A number comes out. Not seeing any human being. A number comes out. There is a screen. Let's say the number is... 21, we are waiting on our turn. 21 shows, we goes in. The blinkers on the seats, they say, what are the options we have? 21, 21, 21, so we can decide and go there. We went, we sat down. The tablet is there. It says either you can use this tablet or take out your smartphone and connect to place the order. We do that, we place our order, no human beings in sight. There were some guys walking in the background, which are staff. Food comes in on a train. So a train is on a wheels and trains. It just comes in with the food which we ordered. And it, what I ordered, like let's say we are sitting like this, me, my friend. So what I ordered, my order just stopped right in front, in front of me. They are using the cameras to see the hoop. And what our friend here ordered, right in front of him, yeah? So I thought maybe that is a fluke or something. And then my friends were asking, you know, do you want to, you know, eat something else? I was not really hungry, but I said, yes, I want to order one, one more, one more thing. So I made the order again, and now I'm watching the food to come, and again, it, it right in front of me, it stops. Anyways, we eat. Now at this time, a human being comes, a girl, girl comes in, and she said, do you want water? She was not needed, but you know, just you know, just to bring in human in the in the scene, yeah. And now we are ready to pay our bill. The thing is there, app. You pay the bill, you go out. Basically, what I'm trying to say that we see these things in sci-fi movies, but I experienced it. And when I was experiencing it, I was just thinking how many jobs can be just taken out. The technology is right there, but maybe we are not really ready. And maybe that is where your fear is coming out that, oh, maybe I will leave, I will, my job will be gone. Replace, replacement. Maybe, maybe that is one thing. Another thing, after COVID, last year, I was lecturing in Finland, which is known for high advancement. 
It's a very nice theater room, bigger than this. There was glass screen and I could see out. After, the, after my lecture, I was just staying there, just checking out the place, sitting, and I on the outside was very cold, kind of dark, cloudy, a little rain. You know the weather in, uh, in Finland, those countries, very bad. And I see a robot <laughs> on the road. And I see how it stopped because a car was coming from that direction. And then it, it stopped like this, and then it moved, and then it stopped again, then it moved, it stopped again because cars were coming. And very nicely it cleared the road. When it would stop, the red light would blink. When it would move, green light would blink. Yeah, delivery, it was delivering. So although I'm reading this thing for last seven, eight years, and I've watched videos and everything, let me tell you very honestly, it gave me chills to watch it, to really watch it, to really watch it. And even now, when I'm, when I'm speaking about it, it is kind of, you know, it's heavy on me. And when you come back to our beautiful island, it's a different story. We are very behind, very behind. And it is high time that we need to get interested in artificial intelligence, that how, what skills, what capacities, what capabilities we need to build so we are we don't get easily replaced by artificial intelligence. And there are ways, and we are going to talk about that. Yes? And we see it here also. Automation is the, is the future. You go sovereign center, Digicel shop. You go to buy the credit. It's a, it's a robot. You just press in, tick, 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 come out. There are restaurants, New Kingston. You go there, you use the apps. Order is, yeah, so technology is there. On the highway, you're going out from Kingston to Ochi or wherever. There is, you know, when you are entering, there is no human being. It's a click, you press the button, take the ticket. When you are exiting, because they don't, with the money part, they want to collect themselves. Although that is also possible, it can be collected with the app also, but a human being is there. Teller machines, we, see, we saw that when tellers when the machine started coming, a lot of tellers lost their job. Yeah. So automation is high. It is going to come. We need to see that what are the things which are going to be automated in the future. And what are the things where maybe a lot of automation is not possible? What is our role? Learn those skills and then move, move forward. Is this connected now? Yes? Yeah, so we're going to, this is a couple of things we're going to do, try to spend some time, time in removing misconceptions, embrace artificial intelligence. Some of the AI success stories I'm going to share with you, challenges, opportunities, and then some simple, workable way forward in our con context in Jamaica. Yeah, because I gave you examples of Hong Kong and Finland. We are not in competition. We just need to improve ourselves. Today should be better than yesterday. That is it. And the next day should be better from the former day. That's all. That's all. One step at a time. No need to panic or no need to worry that, oh my god, other countries are so far. No problem. No problem at all. So misconception, like AI will replace humans. Yeah. So it is not about replacing human. It is about making the task of a human being easier, faster, at a less cost. Yeah, that is what it is. It's not about replacing. AI will do the things which we can delegate to AI. And the time we have now, we will use it in more productive things. Maybe on thinking, thought process, idea generation. Although, in that aspect also, AI is doing a lot of things there, yeah? So it's not about replacing, it is improving the experience. For example, Chrome, Google, all of us use Google, we go and do searches, yeah? So Google Chrome has added few features related with artificial intelligence. They are there out now, you can use them, yes? 
even when you know when you are typing something on google and it gives you some options that maybe this is what you are trying to type that is weak artificial intelligence in broader sense not exactly but in broader sense yes so it makes our work faster yeah so this thing need to think about and do not fear ai when we are talking about job re replacement because yes a lot of jobs will be redundant that that portion is true when people say ai will take over and get the jobs that is absolutely correct but it is half statement next part is that it will create more jobs so the going forward is new different type of jobs will be there yeah i want to show you this world economic forum yeah so 85 million different type of jobs are going away slowly delegated to ai and other forms of technology but 97 million new jobs are coming in new type of works yeah so yes it is going but new things are coming in yeah for example this one ai prompt eng engineering prompt is basically chat gpt you go in there you say do this whatever basically you are writing a prompt yeah so how to write that prompt how to talk with chat gpt in the language which it understands so one way is write me an essay on globalization it will write you but if you properly understand how to make chat gpt write the best essay on globalization then you are not going to say write me an essay on now you are going to talk in the language of which it understand yes so prompt engineers at that time 300k per year so it's not about replacing ai will not replace but a person who can use ai in a better way they are going to of course make your job challenging if you and me are in the same job but you are also taking help from artificial intelligence you are better than me if you and me both of us are accountants and you are very good in excel i am not who 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 is going to get the job you you are good in excel same thing with artificial intelligence and let me say one thing here i am so happy your university is doing fantastic job they have created a policy on use usage of generative artificial intelligence that is very good excellent how many of you have maybe read it maybe it is not circulated yet or even if it is circulated you know sometimes students take time in reading those type of things but use they are basically giving you permission to use in certain parameters to use chat gpt and other type of generative instruments so you should use them and learn what is what is happening there now when once automation starts very interesting type of business environment comes in wanted to talk a little bit about future of work before we speak a, a little bit on education so for example this one kai fu li he is a taiwanese businessman he started a st startup ch in china in 8 month valued 1 billion us dollar now you need to do the search how many people were working in startup and you will be yeah. experts are saying that in next 3 to 5 years there will be companies which will be generating more than 1 billion dollars and the number of employees would be 20 15 10 or 5 it is a po possibility that it can be a one man show one person with an idea how to use this not to make you're not talking about making you don't have to know how to make these things no it's a possibility this time is going to come it is going to come for sure we need to prepare for that type of time yeah 
And I'm sure you guys are thinking, you know, oh, this is too much far-fetched, it is not going to happen, and so on. 200 years ago when Wright brothers were saying, we are going to fly in the air and aeroplane will be there, people said, it's crazy, right? And now it is common space. And you guys are using chat GPT, so it is not, you know, it's not that far-fetched for you also. Microsoft invested more than $10 billion in the company which is behind ChatGPT, which is OpenAI. $10 billion US dollars they have invested. Why? Why? Make things go fast. Let people go home. Let them do other activities. Yes, it's a lot of money. Google, Amazon, just in less than two weeks into, into 2020, 24, 5,500 tech employees. I want to emphasize on tech. These are not people with bachelors in business and you know that type of simple education. They have skill set. A lot of interviews they go through to, to get employed with these type of companies. They got the job, but they are getting laid off. People who are skilled, who passed the test and got the job with the best companies in the world. And the company saying, ah, you are very good, but excuse me. Yeah. So embrace AI, don't run from it. And I want to talk a little bit about collaborative intelligence. What is collaborative in intelligence? You can see the slide there. Human knowledge and artificial intelligence. It's a point of, you know, a shake hand, just like in this picture, a shake hand, yeah? What technology can do and what human knowledge is there. Because, you know, you can't just bring in artificial intelligence apps in the university. It's, it's not going to happen like that because AI needs some prompts, some way to start, a context. So a context will come from the people who have 20, 30 years of working experience at Michael. And this is what it is. This is how the teachers are. This is how the students are. This is what is happening. And then using some form of technology there. Yeah? So collaborative intelligence, improvement of it, processes. Let's talk a little bit about universities because that is what the Georgia State University is using GPS on student advising. So student advising happens in almost every country. Nothing new in that. But what is new is that it is not the case where a student goes to the advisor when they have problem or some, 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 something with some issue. There is, there is data about students, about their grades, about their experience, which is going in the feed. And the access of that data is to the advisors and other related people in the university, and as they see any fluctuation or any fall down on the performance of student, they engage the student, or they engage the class, or they engage the teacher, or they want to see, okay, what is happening? Data, so data is very important, because artificial intelligence is going to run on data. The more data you have with less faults, clean data, only then you, so first step for Myco can be just to, you know, clean up the data. First step, get the data from the student. And then, you know, recently, government of Jamaica is coming up with the, has already launched the data privacy policy and those type of things. Yeah, so not only in student advising, they are using it for student re retention, graduation, and experience. You can read more in detail. Just run a Google search, Georgia State University. Using artificial intelligence, you will find something. This is a classroom, a picture from classroom in China. You see, if you can see, if we can make this picture bigger, if I'm not sure if it is possible, so the audience can see this, this picture. So there is headsets on the student. Students sitting in the class, there is a headset, green light, red light. When the green light is on, it, it is showing that student is concentrating, he is focused, paying attention to what is happening. When the red light turns on, shows student is not really focused on what is happening. 
Yes? So the teacher and the data is also coming on the screen of the teacher. So as the red light turns on, he can maybe engage more with the student. See, if there is there any problem? Are you understanding what is that? Those type of things. Same data is going on the cell phones of the parents. So before you reach home, your parents know, how was your performance in the school? This is already happening. Now you can debate on the ethical part and, you know, is it good? What are the flaws? That is another debate. But I'm just talking about the usage of artificial intelligence. Mind reading is basically already happening. You know, reading someone's mind. It is already happening. The example I gave you when you are spending a lot of time on TikTok, basically, artificial intelligence has read your mind that these are the things which you want to see, and it is showing you, and you are spending time. So AI reading someone's mind is not something for the future. It is already happening, already. Yeah, this is an example. So one is that, I'm showing you another example. This is a guy who is paralyzed. His hands and body is not working. That thing is on his head, as you can see in the picture. And he's thinking, and whatever he's thinking, it is being written. It's already happening. Khan Academy, you must check out, those of you who are in education. Yeah? Khan Migo. Yeah? They have launched artificial intelligence app. They are charging four US dollar per month, which is not a lot. 500, 600, I don't know the exchange rate, maybe six, 700 USD, uh, Jamaican dollar. AI tool for learning and teaching. Yeah. All educators should check that out. All students should check that out, irrespective of what is your area, just to see what options are there. Maybe just pay for one month, just pay $4, and just run it out and see what it can do. So personal, personalized advising, prompt feedback, automate, administrative tasks, these are some of the things where artificial intelligence is being used by various universities across the world. So the idea is that if Deloitte can use AI to read documents faster, why students cannot? Why the teachers cannot? Why the university administrators cannot? The technology is there. They can read it and ask it to write the summary. It will write you the summary. Yeah. Why not? Companies are using it. We need to run universities in the way corporate sector is, 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 is being run. If Amazon can have AI features to answer shoppers' questions why universities, universities cannot use AI to answer basic student questions. Why? These are questions which, you know. This is a very interesting study. Chat GPT found to give better medical advice than real doctors in blind study. Chat GPT is giving better advice in terms of quality and in terms of empathy. When you are going to talk, doctor, you are looking for two things. That is, is the quality of advice or my treatment is good. Chat GPT performing better. Is the doctor more empathy, more you know, concern? Same thing with, with teachers. Quality of advice and the teacher is care, concern, you know, understand the situation. Same things. Yeah. So this is a scientific study, scientific paper. Yeah? Let me show you the if we can bring this picture bigger so audience can, can see that. Yeah? So on the left hand side. You are not going to, I think, see it. Let, let me just explain to you. Both, in the both sectors, it is showing that chat GPT is very good or good in terms of quality and very, shows a lot of very empathetic and high empathy in terms of empathy, of course. Yeah? So in both scales. But I'm not saying that replace the doctors or replace the teachers and bring in artificial intelligence and it starts giving. No. It's about collaborative, handshake. 
So if doctor is making some mistake, doctor is giving, I'm a doctor, I give my advice. AI is there, I take AI's advice, read, the, read, read what AI is saying, make my advice a little better. That's all, that's all it. So chat GPT, if you are asking chat GPT to do all of your ass assignment, that's not, that's not a nice way to use it. But you can write your first paragraph and put it in chat GPT and ask chat GPT, what do you think about it? What are flaws I'm making? How I can improve it? And your, your, your university has created a policy <laughs> which says that you can do that. It's not plagiarism as long as you are telling, giving the reference. It's perfectly fine. Nothing is wrong in that. Effective collaboration, if we want to, in education sector, if we want to do effective collaboration, four main things. There are many things, but four I'm highlighting. Number one, data. Data will be, will be important no matter what job you are doing. You need to be good in data analysis, no matter what you are doing or your students are doing. Yeah. In every, they are doing English literature. They need to be good in statistics. They are doing psychology. They need to be good in mathematics. Just go on top university, Stanford University psychology program and see which courses they are giving. You will see fundamentals of mathematics. Now, why maths is important for psychology? Because AI is the future. You need to know those things. At least the basics, yeah? Understand the c capacities and limitations of machine, robots, robotic arms. That would be important. There are some things which they still cannot do. Contextualizing, context, and I mentioned that. You know, human context, human knowledge. Yeah? That would be important. Because as you guys know, chat GPT is making some mistakes here and there. Yeah? So a human will just, you know, see what is happening. Amazon warehouse, go on YouTube, write Amazon warehouse robots management. You will see 50, 60 robots moving on the, on the floor. And one, one, one man or girl standing here and just managing, monitoring, everything is fine or not. That is how they are doing it. Just go on YouTube and search assembly line of cars, where the cars are being manufactured. You will see robotic arms all over, you know, doing all the work, and few people are managing that. Ethical consideration, and panel is going to talk about ethics also, very important. What opportunities are there in education? Finding the right students, persuading them to come to the university, just like various universities do marketing, strengthening retention, universities are doing that, that job personalized coaching, and that is where the future is going. It is not one lecture for everyone. Whatever I'm saying now, and you guys are listening, this is not the right way to do it. Use AI, see, take the map from all of you, what you know, what you don't know, and build from, from, from there. Yeah. So let's say there is someone in the audience who know all these things. For them, I'm very, very boring. Yeah. They know it already. But for someone who does not know a thing, they will say, wow, what is, what is going on? Yes. So that is personalized coaching is very important. Adapting to curriculum needs. I mentioned those things. Going forward, CEO of Salesforce is saying that AI is going to be new human right. What are the human rights? Freedom of speech, access to clean air, those type of things. So he's saying going forward, Artificial intelligence is going to be new human right. Countries which will have artificial intelligence excellence are going to go up. The countries which are not going to work on them, they are even going to further down. This gap is just keep on increasing. And it is a possibility it will increase very fast also. You saw it. Generative AI chat GPT came and just, you know, a lot of people started using it. Yeah? yeah. 
just like with other type of technologies. I was reading a blog, and I, uh, I encourage you to read the blog posts of uh, Honorable Bill Gates. Yeah? In November last year, three, four months ago, he's writing this blog. You just have to type the blogs of Bill Gates, and it will come. He, he writes he write those things. So in, in November, he's saying AI is about to completely change how we use computers. Completely change. So he's looking at the future where you are not really typing or maybe you know doing a lot of manual thing. A lot of things is. And I showed you example of Chrome. They are adding AI features there. So how to prepare for this type of you know future, AI enabled future? Yeah, different things can be done. What is Elon? Elon Musk looks to connect human brains directly to devices and communicate just by thinking. He has a project which is launched and he is talking about chip, brain chips. His company is making brain chips, which install in head. And he is saying that as they become ready, he will install a chip himself in his brain. Yeah, so would you, would you like to get a computer chip installed in your brain? No, no, no. No, no one would want to get here, at least here, Maybe, I should not say no one, maybe there is someone, but majority will not. But do we know that in animals, human beings have been impl 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 uh, implanting chips in various parts of body, including brain, for at least last 30 years? At least. You can Google search and find. Yeah. And how much advancement has come. You can also Google search that in Sweden, people are installing chips in their hands for locks like door lock, car lock, those type of things. They are already installing. And I'm not making up stories. I'm here, you can Google up, you know, search, and we can talk afterward. If you don't find, I will search, search it for you. It's already happening. It is just like self-driving cars are already out there, but would you like to sit in a self-driving car? No, yeah? No, I understand that. But when you are flying in the aeroplane, do you know how much percentage of aeroplane is self-driven and what is the role of pilot? But all of us are sitting there. It's fully automated in these times. Pilot role is basically just to make you ease. <laughs> and you can see, the pilots tell you to, on YouTube, you know, you can find these things. They tell how it goes up, how it lands, everything. Totally. As a matter of fact, if there is some problem with technology in the air, then it's problem. It's problem. So they are not saying that, no, they are not going to put me the pilot. No. The pilot should be trained, very well trained. But when he's in the domain, he is using technology. Same way, a lecturer, a student should be very well trained. But as they go in the field, they should take advantage of artificial intelligence. I'm going to conclude here. I can go talk on and on, but I was all, I, thank you for giving some of your time. I was first given 15 minutes, and but our colleague said, let him speak if he wants to speak. So. <laughs> But I'm going, this is the last slide. A workable way forward. What can we do? Simple, workable, in our context, in Kingston, in Jamaica. Four points. Number one, any problem you have in the education, co-create a solution. It is not just you alone. You are administrator or you are student, no matter what you are. It's not just one man show, it is co-creation taking different stakeholders, taking their opinion, solution to build trust and integration. Two things very important for artificial intelligence. Because it is dependent on data, people will only share the true data when they trust the system. 
So trust factor. And then integrating. What is happening here is being integrated in other parts. Yeah, so that is one thing. We need to start working on that. Number two, start small to pilot the effort. Don't put a university-wide thing. Start small in one department, in one faculty. Learn from that. Chat GPT, you have the policy. Don't just start all over the campus. Start with a small group. See, learn from it in one semester. What are the mistakes? What are, do the survey. Ask students, how do they want to use it? Ask lecturers, how they want to use it? In the next semester, widen it. Slowly, step by step, step by step, increment it. That is one thing maybe, you know. Number three, use AI as an aid to assist, not to replace. People who are already working, for example, in micro university, don't first ensure them that we are using AI not to replace you. You will have job. Maybe you will not have this specific job, but some other job. Yeah. So make them, you know, at ease. And in that, you know, of course, some people will lose their, their job. The people who will lose their job, it will be their own mistake. Because they are not preparing for the future. They are waiting that university will prepare. They are waiting their lecturers will prepare. No matter you go to Harvard University, they are not going to prepare you. They will come to talk. They will give you an environment. I'm, I'm just, this is my first visit. Nice environment you have. You have lawns, you have other type of things. These type of seminars are being arranged. You have nice faculty here. They will just give you start. Now they did this. This is presentation. This is a start. Now when you go home, you need to spend time and search what is happening and where you want to go in your field. No one can do it for you. Yeah, so that thing is very important. And, and last and maybe very important is finding partners and tools that assist in building the model. So for example, a painter, not just, don't just paint yourself. See how you can use artificial intelligence to make your work better. Video, editing, whatever, you know, use that type of things. So many other things to say, but thank you very much for giving me your ears. Uh, we can take the questions later on and uh, maybe chat after the, after the seminar is over. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you so much, Mr. Ahmad, for sharing with us. I am just observing the faces in the audience, and I'm sure some persons might have even more concerns about artificial intelligence, as well as some persons are saying, oh, but I am already using it, so I have no issues whatsoever. No. Let me see the hands of those persons who have never owned a cell phone. All right. Great. So do you know that when cell phone was invented, many persons had the same fears about this new invention? So years from now, generations to come will be in the same position we are in now. They will say, how could we have lived without artificial intelligence? What was going on in 2024? That was a dark period. Believe it or not, it will happen. Rogers suggested that diffusion of innovation sometimes helps us to understand the needs of the market and gradually allows persons to gravitate towards things that, according to our first presenter, will make us work smarter. Because we are an educational institution, based on the first presenter, if we could get AI to do some of our tasks for us, like marking your scripts, how many persons would fully embrace AI? 
mark your scrape, clean your room, go to the market for you, wash, clean, you see? So we have things that we would want artificial intelligence to be, be doing for us. And, and that's, the, that's the point. That's some of the points that were made by our first presenter. It's nothing for us to fear. It's for us to have an understanding of and to see how best we can use it to enhance productivity. All right. So the issue of ethics and regulatory framework is very important. As was mentioned before, we have an AI statement that was just approved by our academic board, and that will be shared by our academic uh, managers, including our vice president for academic affair in short order with our students and faculty. Now, what are some of the ethical responsibilities what are some of the frameworks that exist? Dr. Damian Black is going to be sharing with us at this time on policy debates, ethics, and a regulatory framework. He will join us via Zoom. Make him welcome, please. technology, its application and its use, and it certainly uppermost in our minds through time has been the issue of its impact. Will we continue? Will we be made redundant? And certainly we want, therefore, to acknowledge this conversation as we move forward. As, as my colleague just mentioned in his presentation, artificial intelligence has had a major impact so far and is profoundly reconfiguring all aspects of our society's economies and then certainly labor markets. Church education institutions at all levels have got to respond and to respond appropriately with respect to these changes. And certainly when we speak in terms of the role of policymakers, which is what my presentation has to deal with, we certainly understand that we are coming in after the fact in, in terms of the rapid spread and engagement of artificial intelligence technologies across the spectrum and in various sectors. So we do acknowledge that AI is technology that is responding, changing quickly, and responding perhaps in, in, a, in a more rapid way, a more dynamic way, that we have been able to respond and within the limited time frame of its of rolling out, to what extent can we even foresee the implications of AI to society? We do note, however, that there are some significant opportunities to be had in terms of the relationship between artificial intelligence and tertiary education. Uh, Dr. Leon just mentioned their very simple, very basic matter of the, the assessing uh, student assignments. To what extent might it be used going further? In looking at research and, and uh, mining data, assessing that data and presenting it with respect to students in terms of their performance, students in terms of those who, given certain trends, uh, might be able to better handle or negotiate X, Y, or Z. And there are fears associated with such uh, implications, but certainly we do know that tertiary education has got to respond and has got to adopt, adapt to such changes and, serve, and to the extent possible to lead artificial intelligence developments through updating curricula, adding new courses and programs that are related to uh, artificial intelligence and its impact on the traditional core and indeed changing the traditional core to reflect the realities of the current um, space and the technological environment. Uh, we do understand an appreciation for the role and impact that AI may also have for administration. So, church education has the potential to play a significant role, and AI certainly has the potential to impact positively 
and tertiary education space so that all stakeholders might benefit. We have in within tertiary education the opportunity in shaping the current era as the skills and technologies to develop AI are advanced. Knowledge about AI is generated and shared and people are supported to become more resilient in the face of these changes. In 2019, in recognition of the impact of AI on education, a conference was held in Beijing on artificial intelligence and education. UNESCO was, was one of the lead players where this is concerned and they brought together representatives from member states, international organizations, academic institutions, civil society and the private sector to focus on this matter of artificial intelligence and education. To what extent could the, the participants reach agreement or some consensus on necessary adaptations to the artificial intelligence era, exchange information and lessons learned, build international cooperation, and examine the potential of AI to meet sustainable development goal four, which speaks to inclusive and equitable quality education. They produced what was called the what is called in fact the Beijing Consensus. The Beijing Consensus. And I would like to just highlight some of the areas that we have all been called on to reflect on as we treat with issues of policy development, uh, regulating defining regulation and also the extent to which we treat with the ethical issues that arise as a result of the interaction with AI. So the extent to which we, 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 we plan for AI in education, which is fundamental, we can't see it and ignore it. We have got to acknowledge it and the extent to which our policies and how we are moving that strategically from a governmental policy-making perspective are influenced by a recognition of AI and an active engagement with artificial intelligence. Uh, as I just noted, artificial intelligence has the, the significant potential to benefit positively education management and delivery, uh, to empower teaching and teachers, to improve learning and learning assessment, uh, the development of values and skills for life and work in an era that whether we like it or not will be dominated by artificial intelligence and the extent to which it can facilitate and support lifelong learning opportunities for all. And as noted with respect to social SDG 4 big pardon, promoting equitable and inclusive use of AI in education and also matter of gender equity. So the basic concept is treated a whole host of issues that are critical in our conversation this afternoon. There are some challenges, um, as, as we, has already been noted, in terms of the ethical implications for artificial intelligence in higher education, tertiary education. It could be used to misuse and abuse private data, um, replicate gender and other biases, given the perspective of those who would define the system and, and, and how it is structured to act and function. The, 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 the biases that reside within those who develop it may come through in terms of the system and how it operates. How is information generated? The extent to which um, it's not just uh, male, female, but, but it's also our different uh, racial, ethnic backgrounds and the extent to which um, those biases may or may not be affirmed. So we've got to appreciate uh, this. How do we ensure that in, in, as we move forward, there are and will be greater risks? And so what, to what extent are we able to, given the total context, protect the rights and opportunities of students, faculty, and staff? We appreciate that some persons may see this threat that AI is deemed to be more reliable than traditional human-based management systems. But one of the things that we do appreciate is that AI, uh, although I've heard some protagonists argue as such, but AI, from my perspective, cannot necessarily replace skills such as critical thinking or, and creativity. Now, it may approach it, but the extent to which it can do so um, is it, 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 left to be seen. The extent to which AI can predict patterns and therefore arrive or suggest conclusions is significant, but as human beings, we do know the unpredictable and dynamic nature of life. So the extent to which the, the, the abuse of collective data 
of biases that may emerge and the extent to which we may blindly follow um, uh, outcomes or suggested approaches and, and definitions coming from uh, these are things that we have got to appreciate. Uh, AI development is currently concentrated in the private sector. Uh, to what extent can tertiary education and higher education institutions uh, negotiate, given the fact that very often such entities, apart from a very few who are well endowed and resourced, are, are cash strapped, resource constrained, and the extent to which AI requires the investment of resources to be able to do, then what you will have here to treat with is tertiary education as a sector as a whole, research within higher education institutions will be affected by the extent to which it has got to adopt as opposed to define the technology. And so this is a critical um, matter that we have got to, to note. So whilst it is that there is reasonable access, but we cannot ignore the cost of development and the extent to which if we are not involved in development, then we are locked out of the process of use and application and thus be able to define um, the ethical action and use. So we do note and appreciate then that there are some basic recommendations that will come out in terms of the ethical use of, of AI in education. Um, so one, and I want to commend the Michael University College for the, its development of its AI statement, the draft was produced and shared with us as panelists, and it actually covers the basis. It touches with and treats with matters that emerge from the data consensus on artificial intelligence and education. It acknowledges and it drives students, teachers, stakeholders that they should uh, acknowledge appropriately the persons, sources, and tools that influence the ideas or generate the content in paper. And we know that AI generating um, AI has this role. And to the extent to which that is captured, the appropriate use of services, sources, and tools. Um, we know and appreciate the fact that the AI tool cannot be listed as author since it is pulling from. But as students, as teachers, we are all um, responsible as producers of papers to affirm the, the, the sources. Uh, the, the extent to which we, we have got to use the opportunity to teach students about AI and its ethical use is also something that emerges from the AI statement produced by Michael. So how can they develop their ethical writing and content production skills? Uh, we have got to ensure that this is, 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 is enshrined as we look at the ethics and policy development. Our teachers, faculty should receive training on ethical use of AI, including the development of relative learning, relevant like about learning outcomes, learning activities, and assessment strategies. And so the extent to which, within the institution, that the, the rules, the approaches, and the appropriate use for AI is defined and stated clearly, and that all stakeholders are oriented and sensitized as to these rules is going to be critical. So, uh, the micro is to be commended with respect to this development, and it certainly does allow for a paradigm or a model that may be used by further institutions. So, if, if we just to close, I want to note that from the perspective of an entity such as the Jamaican Church Education Commission, given our role, in, uh, which may be just captured in three words, regulation, registration, and development, but from the regulatory perspective, that is to say the definition of standards that guide stakeholders, and we certainly appreciate what it is that they, looking at the Beijing consensus, looking at the U European uh, National Association for, or sorry, European Network for Academic Integrity, uh, Beijing consensus, some of the work coming out of uh, UNESCO, AI and education guidance for policy makers. There is a rich uh, source of network uh, that is there for information that we certainly use and apply in our standards. And certainly we will be rolling out as we move forward some guidance for institutions with whom we interact. So as to ensure, one, as coming out of the uh, UNESCO's own guidance, the inclusive and equitable use of AI in, in education, leveraging AI to enhance education and learning, promoting the development of skills for life, including
been teaching how AI works and its implications for humanity, and is certainly safeguarding transparent and auditor reviews of education data. More and on as the conversation unfolds. Thank you so very much for this opportunity. Thank you so much, Dr. Black, for sharing with us. And at this time, we're going to be pausing to allow. I know that you have many questions. I see our students writing. We're going to be pausing at this time to accommodate questions that, they, that you might have. And we will respond to those questions. And then we will take our other two presenters. Can we get a mic in the middle there are microphones if you have your questions you can just indicate by way of raising your hand and there is a question at the back Go ahead, Mr. Wong. Yes, um, the first presenter um, pointed out a WEF statement on 97 million or billion, I don't quite sure, 97 million jobs will be created at the loss of about 87 million. What will this 90, the 97 million jobs entail for those who are disenfranchised by AI? That's question one. And the second question is more of a religious nature. Is there any evidence that AI is, in, is not influenced by any spiritual force? I mean, the Christian and other religious people will want to ask that question. So I do it for them. So that's two questions. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for the questions, Mr. Wong. And I feel somehow that the second question is Mr. Wong's question, you know. What Mr. Wong said, I'm I doing it for them. I was the Muslim also. <laughs> All right, go ahead. Uh, Mr. Uh, Ahmad, do you want to respond to the questions? Yes, sure. Uh, thank you very much for interesting questions. Yes. Uh, maybe I was not expecting the second one, but... <laughs> Let's go with the second one first. I believe that almost all religions, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, the God has said that try to excel in whatever field, in whatever way uh, you can excel. Try to be better. Uh, so AI is, in one way, it is going to help us become better. So maybe that is one take which you can take. The first question uh, which you had, um, Basically, it was that people who will lose their job, what are the options for them? Yes. That is the question, yes. So first of all, the way I'm looking at it is that right now as we speak, we need to identify that what can we do, what skills we can learn right now, so that in the future of work, which is technology-driven, which is automated, uh, we will not lose our job. So first part would be that, that learning skill set which will help us to keep employed in the future. And then another context I would like to share is that entrepreneurial thinking is going to be very important going forward because in various uh, societies, various economies, the way I'm looking at it, uh, if you can do something which is going to create job that is going to be going to put you in a better position than trying to find a job from other people. Uh, so entrepreneurial spirit, I think, that is the second thing which you can think about. And lastly, um, as you mentioned, what is going to happen to people who will lose their job? A question was asked. Uh, by the moderator to the audience that um, would you like your uh, <laughs> exam papers to be examined by artificial intelligence, something like that. So, and most people said no. So I want to like, just I'm just thinking that, you know, if there is a class where the lecturer is teaching 300 students and there are 300 uh, 
scripts to mark. Um, do you really think that the marker is reading your script line by line with the type of handwriting you have written your paper in? Do you think so? Like they have 300, do you think so? They should read it, yes, but practically are they reading it or not? But when you will be using artificial intelligence, it will be reading your work line by line and marking your work. So that is maybe the third link you can, you can create. But yes, this concern is valid concern that there will be people who will be losing jobs. So we need to prepare for that type of eventuality that we don't. Okay, Go what ahead. I have to say is not really a question, it's a statement. At the end of the day, as an educator, we are taught to look at each student individually. We know our students' strengths and weaknesses, and we have to apply some level of in emotional intelligence. I don't think artificial intelligence will apply what a teacher will apply when marking papers or marking the work of his or her student because of how we will know our student. So for me, I don't think AI should be marking students' work because when I can say, okay, this student is coming from a 10, they might not spell some of these words correctly, but at the end of the day, I can see the improvement and I can see what they're trying to say Artificial intelligence won't know all of these things. All right. Thank you so much for sharing that perspective. And I'm seeing two other raised hands. Let me just... And we're going to take your response, Mr. Record. And those are the only two other questions or comments that we will take. And then we will go to our presentations and we will continue with the questions. So just a quick contribution to the answer um, previously given to, I think it's Mr. Wong, you were yes. referred to him as Mr. Yes. Wong's question about those for folks lo losing their jobs. <clears throat> At every industrial age, the, ex the exact same concern was uttered by, yes. by, by whether it was politicians or whether it was the people, right? Because no one jumps up, very few people jump up. I mean, I'm one of them, but not, not many people jump up when change is happening, right? Everyone resists, most people resist change. I want to do what I'm doing, the way I'm doing it, don't bother me, right? And so <clears throat> we'll find the folks who were uh, in the fields when the machines came along to plow the fields, um, they were up in arms. But practically every one of those people, those who had who, 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 who thought critically and had some sort of you know, system thinking and who were lifelong learners, all of those people found something else to do. And so uh, there are hundreds of papers written already around all the potential things that, um, all the potential jobs that were replaced, but then massive lists, which I think could be pulled from the, uh, the World Economic Forum reference, but there's a tremendous amount that's not going to be replaced immediately um, by, you know, by the AI tools and technologies that are there. So it's a continuous cycle every industrial age, every time that something comes along. So I, I'm not just jumping to say, well, don't worry about it, but <laughs> the, the cry is the same every time. Right? Yes. Thank you, Mr. Record, for your response, and we will take our question. Um, good afternoon. Or good evening. Yes, so uh, this question was actually from the chat during Mr. Ahmad's presentation, but I'm curious about the answer as well. There were, uh, um, the viewer was asking, how will AI contribute to critical thinking? Yes, so that is already basically hap hap happening. Like, for example, generative AI, you write something and put it on, on the chat, GPT and you ask it to analyze it more critically. So that part is already happening. You, are, you make a drawing and you put it on the generative AI and you ask it to analyze it critically, how it can be made. 
um, people are already doing these type of critical thought processes. Like, for example, designing chairs. Yeah, designing, like you are sitting on some sort of chair. So it has like, basically, if you look at the structure, it has, it has just basically the way it is, the legs are designed in a very different way. If you can look whenever you get the time, the way the design of this chair happened on which people are sitting. So same, th same thing on generative AI, people are giving in the models of different types of chairs and then asking it to critically analyze that what are the different f new forms which are not already in the database. We can do something like that. In terms of design, this is already happening. In terms of creativity, like sometimes people will think that artificial intelligence is not creative and this is something which Human beings, only they can do. That's basically not correct, if I can say that. Because writing a novel, for example, writing a literature, literary piece, is not that creative enough. So now, just run a Google search that artificial intelligence writing literary novels and winning first prize. Do the Google search now and see what comes up. It is contesting with human beings. We are talking about universities. Go on the website of Deakin University. On their website where they are promoting the use of artificial intelligence for students and staff, for the university there is a poem which is written by artificial intelligence and how that poem was created, different types of sentiments of students was put in the feed and from that student experience, a poem was written. It is just like that we ask all of you that how was your experience of tonight, this evening's seminar, you give us your responses, we put all those responses in AI and ask it to write a poem and it writes that poem Creativity is there, critical analysis is there. So these things are, are there. We just need to start using it, be more open towards, towards it. These things are going to come in. Going back to your point, we just need to prepare ourselves what future is coming, basically. Yes, thank you. So I will, I will ask the question to the two leading AI tools on the planet right now. And uh, I'm using the most, up, the most advanced version of ChatGPT, which is 4.0. And I also am using Gemini, which is a competing product, which is by Google. So Gemini says, artificial intelligence has the potential to contribute to critical thinking in several ways, acting both as a tool and as a catalyst. I'm not going to read the entire list of things that came under the tool or the entire that came on, a, came on a catalyst. I'll just read a summary. That says, however, it's important to remember that AI is a tool, and like any tool, it can be used for good or for bad. It's critical to develop and use AI in the way that augments rather than replaces, right? Replaces human critical thinking skills. Ultimately, the responsibility for critical thinking lies with individuals who must use AI tools effectively and independently. Uh, evaluate information and augments. So that's the answer from Gemini, which is uh, a Google tool. I'll now give the answer from OpenAI's leading product, uh, which is ChatGPT. So it says, contribution of AI to critical thinking can be observed in multiple dimensions, including its role in augmenting human decision-making, similar to what uh, was just said a while ago, uh, reshaping ed educational methodologies. It brought in education as number two, right? education methodologies, and enhancing problem-solving capabilities. However, it is essential to consider both the potential benefits and limitations in each set setting. So it did go down to a list of settings. I'm not going to go into details, but just read, read a high level. So number one, augmenting human decision-making, pros, data analysis, uh, pattern recognition, scenario simulation for, for, and, and forecasting. Cons, over-reliance on AI. Um, bias and ethical considerations are the cons. In terms of reshaping uh, ethical uh, educational methodologies, pros, personalized learning. I'll pause there because I just wrote a program, I just wrote a proposal to um, 
some team members who are working on AI around a personalized learning system. And I believe with technologies like this, uh, very similar to what was uh, mentioned in terms of the, 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 the um, what's his name again? Khan Academy's Canmigo, um, which is a personalized learning tool, which allows each, imagine, each individual student in Jamaica, don't know what the numbers are right now, 600,000 or 700,000, imagine each individual student in Jamaica having their own individual AI tool which interfaces between them and their teacher and gives the teacher continuous, continuous, uh, uh, I guess, tracking of their educational journey. Remember, that tool is not set up to ever give out any answers. It cannot give an answer. If it realizes that you need help in a certain area, it would prompt you with some more learning, some more uh, education on, you know, along the whole pe pedagogy lines. So it's, it's, it's very interesting you know, where we are heading with this whole, um, with this whole solution, um, solution right now. Um, and of course, enhanced problem solving capabilities, pros, innovative solu solutions, uh, collaborative problem solving, cons, creative and, and intuition, transparency, and explainability. So in the Jamaica Data Protection Act, which is which December one uh, came became mostly enforced with a few small um, small sections being 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 exempted for a few months. Explainability is something that's required. In other words, if a bank is using some sort of automation, including machine learning or generative AI, to make decisions around granting a loan or not, and the person challenges the bank the bank or the financial institution or insurance company have to explain how the technology works. One of the problems with generative AI, which is based upon uh, neural networks, you can't explain what it does. That's one of the challenges. But anyway, uh, we're living in exciting times, folks. Thank you. All right, thank you so much, Mr. Record. We had one last question that we're going to take in this segment of the presentations. And then we'll take your other questions at the appropriate time. Go ahead. I hear the teacher voice. from now because them something almost doctor something. Saying in his studies, um, he made mention of the ethical considerations. As a teacher, ethics means a lot in our context. And so we're having serious issues with that. Um, university students, we are expected, there is this notion of plagiarism. Hello? Yeah. And when you plagiarize them, punish you. Yeah. And you don't gratify, not true. However, AI is saying to me, nothing not wrong with it, but something seems to be ethically wrong. So, because you have to understand, I am seeing where you're coming from, you know, sir, but still, I'm, coming, I'm old school. So we're having some serious issues. If education is about transforming the mind, I don't see AI doing much transformation, you know. As a matter of fact, what I see happening since COVID. Don't put me on the stick for this. Since COVID. You're on. Since COVID, we have a lot of children. So I'm not for them, I'm not Satan. A lot of children are right again since COVID. Because you recognize that you say to them, what is beauty? Describe beauty. I see them here. Gulu, gulu. And so what is now happening, I believe that AI, because I see them within the chat and the GPT, and, and I also do something sometimes. I I sit down and try to learn to you know. But I'm saying we have serious issues. We're not doing what education is all about. Transforming this. I heard you, sir, about the little something them there and giving each child. Number one, you don't have money. So when you have money, you can so go put in all of this. And I think Dr. Blake alluded to it, that it's going to need money. It takes cash to care. But, sir, we have a little problem. I hear your idea, you know. But the old ethics something, that is where my big problem is. And unless you can fix AI, because I'm looking at the fact that you would have studied 
You had your own brain and your adrenaline and you went through the process. What AI is about to do is to take that opportunity from the children. And I don't believe, yes, you can work with something, but I like we are promote it. And I said, boy, yes, yes, yes. But look here, allow the children to go through the process. My mother worked hard for me to go through the process. I'm not now allowing my child. Could we allow the children to be children? They might be artificial. As we call them, so artificial. They might do some something. Girl, that's why we have so many. All right. Okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right, thank you so much for sharing your views and your perspective. Ma'am, I hear you loud <laughs> and clear. Loud and clear. Yes. I am a father of two girls, and I was very cautious with their use of technology as, as long as I could be until I couldn't be, right? And then so much so, I did some work for the, the, the Open AI people, and they said to me, Chris, um, who you want to upgrade? Because all of us were using the free version of Open AI. The paid version is, I don't know, 20, 100 times more powerful. And so I paused and I said, add my two children. So I upgraded them to the most powerful version. And then I sat down and I explained to them the power that they now have in their hands and what the cap what's capability of. So one of the things that I was, um, look, I'm a writer also. I've, I've, I've published a book. I've published between five and 600 articles over the last 50, um, 15 years in the newspaper. And yes, you don't want to go somewhere and all of a sudden you look and you're reading something. I said, hold on there. That sounds familiar. I mean, you read that, <laughs> right? And somebody have their name on it. I've seen it happen before, right? So I do hear loud and clear about um, the plagiarism, and it is something that globally it's a massive challenge. Uh, a number of the international news agencies, um, I think uh, the, the most popular one, I think it might have been either Wall Street Journal, New York Times, I don't remember, I can't remember right now which one it was, I'd have to look it up. But some of the top um, media organizations are concerned the fact that these tools are going and scraping the information from the site and regurgitating it and putting it out as, as their own, right? So it's a general challenge that we have. And again, I'm going to use my old time, um, you know, when fire was invented or even, even well, let, let me go after that. When we started with a steam engine, there were people complaining that these strong hearted men who was normally be plowing the fields are now going to lose their work. Why are we, what are we going to have these strong hearted people doing? And they all found something else to do. We will find, we, we, we are finding ways to, to reduce it because there are tools out there to figure out when somebody is using these generative AI tools and not telling you. Because it, it writes with a certain style. I was in a meeting recently and a gentleman presented a report. I mean, I, I sit on a number of committees and you, you get these documents to read. And I read the document. And let me tell you something. After the first read, I know this man never read this. And I asked it in the meeting. I said, excuse me, sir, um, no disrespect, and, and you know, be as open and honest as you can. Did open me I write this? And he said, yes. There's no, there was no feeling. There was no personality. There was, it, it was missing from the document. And so we're going to go through this phase, you know. We're going to go through this phase where people are going to try all of this stuff, and people are going to just spit this thing out. And at the end of it, you're going to realize that, all right, this has no soul, no heart. This was machine created. I want something that a human created. And we're going to go through that cycle when, guess what, we're all valuable again. But it's a combination, right? I think, I think Mr. Ahmad, in his presentation, spoke about that person that is, that, that, that is a user and person who understands how to, how, to, how to enhance his own capability with his additional capabilities. Those are the people that are going to take this thing to the next level. So I am proposing to you to learn it. There's a tremendous amount of free, free um, education out there. Uh, Mr. Mad mentioned uh, the understanding of prompt engineering because the tool and technology is set up in such a way. When we just treat it like Google and just ask it a question, we're going to get out some basic answers. But when you learn prompt engineering and learn how to write a prompt, I was doing a presentation to some teachers uh, last month and when I showed one of the prompts that I wrote, my prompt was three pages long, right? Three folder leaves long. 
And you know, that's approximately about 1,200 words was my prompt to get out a certain content that I want to get out. And when I showed, when they asked the question, one line, and when I asked the question, 1,000 words, <laughs> right? And what I got from what they got, it was night and day. So we have to learn how to use the tool. All right. Yes. Hello, Dr. Young? Yes, go ahead, Dr. Black. Yeah, I just want to just, um, acknowledge what, what my colleagues on the panel have shared in response to, to the questions. I think the issue has to be acknowledged in terms of the fear, which has been evident whenever human society has faced some leap in, in technology and how it, its impact. But one of the things that we also have to appreciate is that we have seen that whilst we have adapted, it is the extent to which human society has, has optimally adapted. So with all the changes in technology, we have also had some negative impact or consequences on the environment with respect to how we relate, um, how the technology has been utilized. And I think that it is appropriate to acknowledge these fears because in the context of uh, technology that is rapidly advancing, and we have not yet grappled with um, how we might ethically use it and craft rules to guide such ethical use. I think uh, my colleagues have spoken from their professional bases and that they are using these things ethically and understand it. But we do know and appreciate that this is not necessarily universally accepted. And so we are going to acknowledge that. But the second thing is to the, to the teacher who shared and expressed her concerns about the need for children to be children. Um, as, as was correctly stated, that you can pick up from material produced, whether it, there is uh, the machine has produced it or a human being has produced it. But, but what I do see, the perspective of many persons really, is if we continue on this techno technologically re related uh, process, uh, which is going to dominate or influence significantly education, and training, and development, human development how people relate to each other, then there are some worrying signals that, that um, we're going to take note of as we move forward. So critically, to, to that teacher who spoke, the basic um, issue of involvement of all of us as, as in, in a home, in a community, etc., to ensure that we uh, facilitate the development of appropriate ethics, the development of appropriate morals, the development of appropriate ways in which we as human beings relate to each other is going to reside in, in the home, in the community, and it's going to require hands-on. I heard what uh, Mr. Rickard had said about the uh, matter of his two daughters, and, and I can see where he is coming from, and I think all of us can appreciate that. So we do what we can, whilst we have the opportunity to influence and shape the minds of those who are interested in our care. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Black, and colleagues for sharing your comments. And I, I just want to, to say that for some of us, we are fearful, and that's okay. All right? That is okay. Typically, when we feel that we are under threat, or we are in a very uncertain situation, we usually respond either, well, physiologically, the response usually is fight or flight. But we can't run away from it because the truth is artificial intelligence is not going to disappear because it doesn't have our approval. Billions have been invested and so, as was indicated in Dr. Black's presentation, it's necessary for us to adapt, but we have to be cautious. We're not going to blindly say that this is the modus operandi and all things are equal, because all things are not equal. But we can't run from it. The 16th of October, 2023, I looked for the date because... I remembered it clearly and I wanted to be certain. I was driving to work and I heard on BBC News that in Britain, somewhere in England, robot Abigail Bailey was employed 
in a private school as an, ed as an headmistress. Yes, you missed the news. That was, that's old news, you know. That's 2023, October. And so it's not something that is going to go away. It is something that we have to contend with. But it's important for us to make sure that we recognize. For me, just listening to the conversation, there is a missing link for many of us as it relates to artificial intelligence. We don't understand that it's a tool. That's the missing link. We think that it's a scary thing that is just going to walk around and take us away. No. It's a tool that relies on data. All right? So I see your hand and I see you want to answer, but I'm going to allow you to answer in the next segment. At this time, we're going to invite Dr. Hugh uh, to talk with us about innovative teaching and learning practices. And I'm sure this is something that, as educators, we are very excited about. And her presentation will follow immediately with uh, Mr. Reckford's adapting to the changing nature of the workplace. All right, so we will take the presentations and then we will take some questions. All right. Um, are you able to, here I should put this in, presentation mode, are you able to hear me? Yes. Yeah, okay. So just a quick outline. Um, I've been fascinated by the presentation so far and um, my, when I um, was asked to participate on this panel, I wondered which of the topics I would, was um, being asked to weigh in on because a lot of my work surrounds ethics and neuroethics, as you will see some of the neurotech and many of the examples that Mr. Ramon gave were actually from the neuroscience world, like brain interfaces and brain chips, and there are some things that I want to clarify on, on that, but my intention was to address what is the concern in terms of education um, and go through some of these topics. Um, primarily made up of anecdotes and best practices. Um, and then of course I stuck in a last slide about my um, ethical neurotech because that's an area that's there to me and it came up. Um, I wanted to quickly talk a little bit about, I wanted to answer one of the, or I, I, one of the questions in the Q&A. Um, I wanted to mention just something here, I have my notes. Um, I, actually, it will, it will be embedded in the conversation as we proceed. Um, so really, the concern um, for AI and education What's, what are really the truly the concerns? And, and the last teacher who shared her concern was about the fear of letting children be children and that sort of thing, right? So there's as much trepidation as there is excitement. The primary concern when this became publicly concerning to folks was plagiarism and then followed quickly by loss of critical thinking skills, right? So I'm really going to spend time on anecdotes and, and offer just a couple ideas. Um, as I was preparing this, I actually was thinking about higher education. So I, mo the education that I do mostly is undergraduates. Um, I also teach graduate students. Um, I teach Tibetan monastics living in exile in India. Um, quite a range, right, but adult learners for the most part. Um, and so there are some differences and nuances with younger students. We need to think about that. So essentially, you know, this was alluded to, and Mr. Record mentioned this quite a bit. We're preparing students for a world that doesn't exist yet. So we're actually making our best guess at what our students will need. There are certain fundamental, foundational things that we can offer them that are scalable and sustainable, and no matter where they go, it will help, right? Mr. Armand mentioned, why do you need math for psychology? Well, statistics is traditionally very important in analyzing these data. And if you don't know how to analyze data, you can tell, like, you know, there's a book called Lies, Damn Lies, and Statistics, right? So you can actually do a whole lot with statistics and it misrepresent information and that sort of thing. So we have to prepare people for the world that they will be living in. Um, so I'll, I'll tell you a, a personal anecdote. I have a 14-year-old son, and uh, when he started writing his handwriting, it was awful. 
content, whereas when I tie notes, it doesn't stick as much as if I write it, right? So because of the way that I was engaged in the learning enterprise when I started, um, I, 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 that's, that's my foundation, that's what it's built on. Um, I can spell better than most of the people who are going um, for in my classes because spell check came along and you don't even need like autocomplete. You don't you can you can mess up the word very terribly and Google will still get you where you need to be, right? Um, my daughter when she was learning to write would ask me to spell words and I would ask her to sound it out and she got very quickly frustrated with that at three or four years old. She took the little cell phone and she did text to talk talk to text so she would talk and say what she wanted to write and then it would type it up for her and then she would copy it up. That's how she learned to write. Um, so the, the world that our children will be living in is different from this one now and we have to attempt to prepare them for what's coming. So I wanted to emphasize that. So what are some of our concerns in terms of this teaching and evaluation when AI enters the scene? So at the higher education levels, um, if you can create an assignment that can be replicated by the computer program, you're probably doing a disservice to your students. So I was not as panicked when ChatGPT dropped um, because I write the kind of assessments that are really hard for ChatGPT to answer at the time. There's been tremendous improvement and the full version was a free version at the time. Um, and I'll share some anecdotes from that because that's what I did um, in my class last spring. Um, not trying to take up too much time, I know we're running quite late and while it's fascinating, I know that it's you know, inching up into the evening. I have here, and I'm just gonna click, hopefully, oh, you know what? The share screen option does not follow when I click, so I'm changing that so that we can see. Um, Earlier it was mentioned about this new UNESCO meeting and I just I wanted to share that. Um, when neuroscience meets AI, what does the future of learning look like? Right, so you can search up some of these things. This was in 2019 before artificial intelligence was publicly available for, for uh, most people to use, right? So what are the links between neuroscience and artificial intelligence when it comes to learning? So neuroethics as the field that I work in tends to conflate a lot of the artificial intelligence things and learning and neuroscience because of we learn with our brains, right? And so if we're talking about learning and we're talking about artificial intelligence interacting with that, um, it becomes a problem for neuroscience as well. So this, um, the Congress on Cognitive Tools in Schools are, are all considering these and this was well before the, um, before it was publicly available. So here I'm gonna go back to my slides and um, here we go. So when this happened, just a little context, these articles started popping up. Chat GPT storm and what can faculty do? Um, and then very quickly after that, faculty realized they could write letters of recommendation with Chat GPT. And all of a sudden it wasn't such a bad thing. Right? Because we spend a lot of time in higher ed, you know, writing these letters of reference and so professors are starting to get out of their assignments by having ChatGPT present a template for them and then you can like populate it with different things. So is it okay to use ChatGPT for generating letters? This is a screenshot when I just Googled faculty and ChatGPT. Um, so this became a major concern and then it, you can see that it, it became a little bit more um, accepted. Now here's something that I think is actually quite fascinating. Um, in January of 2023, this was when I was teaching my class Advanced Neuroethics, OpenAI, right, Artificial Intelligence, Drop Chat GPT, but here's an article um, published in Nurse Education Practice, the education part being the important part, Open artificial intelligence platforms in nursing education, tools for academic progress or abuse. So these are the concerns that we have. What I want you to notice is that the second author on this paper is ChatGPT. I did not bring up the entire article, but the first page 
is written entirely by ChatGPT, and then the human co-author finishes up. That was massively game-changing. So at that point, there were no rules because we build a plane as we fly it, and rules are made after they've been broken. So here, um, in response, this letter is, is ChatGPT a valid author? Uh, um, and as it turned out, different journals, different um, academic journals, decided and editors started coming up with guidelines. So a uh, closer assessment of the authorship of the article, um, you have to establish some principles of authorship and what are the, the delineations. So Springer uh, is one of the publishers. Um, a majority of uh, academic articles, um, they implemented a rule that says that artificial intelligence cannot be a valid author. But it's journal by journal. Right? So you have to see how we can catch up on these things as they are continuing. So what I wanted to just introduce those, um, and really accustom, I'm, I'm trying to be careful about timing here. Um, I'm showing another screenshot. You'll just see a bunch of screenshots, and I'll read some stuff to you, and then we can handle some of these issues in question and answer. A uh, colleague of mine, or a previous colleague of mine, Adam Hutchison, posted on Facebook not too long ago, about a week or so ago, if you're a professor or a teacher who is worried about students using AI to do their work, just beat them to it. Show them what ChatGPT gives you for an answer and ask them if they can do better. I'm constantly playing with ways to incorporate this in class. This is a way to encourage critical thinking and high performance. And of course, you know, people are like, this is genius. I'm intrigued. Let me know how it's working out. So he's using ChatGPT to generate critical thinking questions in class. And I did that last Spring, so around last year, around this time, I actually had my students evaluating um, questions, right? So here are several screenshots. I'm hoping they're legible. I'll read out the parts that are salient or significant. Um, and you'll see that this is one of my students, Michael Yu. He's gone, he's graduated since then, but I wanted to show you um, just a little anecdote. So what I wanted from my students was to see that the answers that ChatGPT were providing were not sufficient, um, and they could say that. And by the end of the class, um, students reported that they realized it was not sufficient and that they would rather do their own work than rely on ChatGPT, um, Gemini wasn't popular at the time, um, to produce something that was substandard, right? So here um, are actually screenshots from my Google Voice um, text messaging. I'm awful about picking up the phone, but I'm great at text. And then the students have access to me through this. This is not my real phone number, so I keep this as sort of my office number. Um, and Michael, one of my students, um, texted me. I ran the articles. I, I, I gave them a prompt in neuroethics, which was around uh, using electric shock to treat um, kids with autism. And um, he told me he refused to take an ethical standpoint, and he found that interesting. So I asked him, as we're just starting to play around with this, had they taken ethical standpoints before? Give me an example, and what specifically did you run? So he explains to me that it generally you know, asked about electric. So this alludes a little bit to what Dr. Record was mentioning um, in terms of the, the prompts. And, and the detail that you can get out of it, right? So, you know, you used to hear, we used to talk about garbage in, garbage out, that kind of thing. And so now, depending on how sophisticated your prompt is, you can have these, these neural networks produce information for you. Again, you don't have access to how they're doing it, so that presents some of the problems when it goes into clinical care and that kind of thing. So exciting, but also tremendously problematic depending on the data sets it's learning from. Um, when I asked it generally about electric shocks for autism, it said the treatments are always unethical, blah, blah, blah. But it says, I'm an AI model and can't make those judgments. So then he tortured it, Michael, my student, and he absolutely kept on feeding it. Then here's the last part. It took me a while, but I finally got it to replicate this. I said, nice. I wanted to see where it abstained, right? So Michael, is a brilliant student who was playing around with this with me to see what sorts of answers we could get. So I started checking in with him. So I saw um, an article or something on Twitter, or now known as X, 
mentioned yet. So we talked a little bit about Gemini and ChatGPT, but this one is Sight.ai. Um, I wrote an example essay with Sight Assistant and ChatGPT, and Sight Assistant was more accurate. ChatGPT used two sources, and one of them was correct, while the other used the wrong author. ChatGPT is notorious for making up citations, by the way, so you can usually catch the plagiarism there. Um, and just like putting the wrong thing in. It looks fluid, it looks like a good paper, but it's actually garbage sometimes. Site assistant, as Michael is saying, probably uses the chat GPT to write it and then a second program to fix and correct the sources, right? So I had this in here to click on as I was thinking about what, um, the, what, what our higher learning um, faculty might be interested in, uh, but I'm not gonna spend any more time on that quickly. But to echo some of the comments that were made earlier about being a, a good prompt writer and the difference between, you know, the three pages, all the leaf pages versus the one sentence, there is, and you can see the hiring range um, the last year in, in 2023 um, was for a prompt writer, the salary range is 175 to $335,000 US dollars if you can gain the system. So I sent this over to, to Michael and I was like, hey, you got a job waiting for you, right? Because he, of, of all my students, have really got the niche of how to um, do this. So when we talk about jobs opening up, you got a prompt engineer and librarian. Those jobs didn't exist before. In the same way that social media manager didn't exist before. When I was in high school, I couldn't dream of being a social media manager. Social media was nothing, right? Um, so I am moving pretty quickly here and I do want to make sure there's time for question and answer, but embracing the utility of this and heading on, and it, you know, working with it head on, making sure that your, your students know you know about it, that you can use it to sort of start a draft and then you can edit it, fix up from there. Um, but you do have to check on the policies. So my co has this, guide, this set of guidelines and principles that we were privy to, um, to, to see, and they're beautiful. And I actually checked what Emory, my institution, I checked on the honor code violations. Um, and of course, they scrambled quickly to build something to, to put in as students were starting to use it and some faculty were panicking. So I wanted to, right there, um, mention just a little bit, there was in Mr. Ramad's talk, he mentioned Georgia State University using um, AI, and I wanted to say that one of our, that's right across the street from us here at Emory, right? So in Atlanta, Georgia State University, and we actually had um, a colleague who, they, they use it for advising, but yes, so there were many years ago before the popularity, so they've been testing out some of these, and we had um, a journal club where one of our faculty colleagues was talking about how they used um, artificial intelligence as a teaching assistant. And they actually ran it through the Turing test, which is, can you tell that you're talking to an artificial um, entity? And um, they, after the whole semester, they asked students, which, you know, one of your TAs was artificial intelligence, this is an online course, could you tell which one it is? And the students by and large could tell which, um, which of the AI was, uh, a, uh, or rather, which of the TAs, teaching assistants, was AI. And they use little things that you didn't even realize. So if I send a question and I get a response very quickly and at 2 a.m., I'm pretty sure that's AI, right? Because our humans are sleeping or should be sleeping. And so people were able to tell. So they edited the AI to respond with a lag and a delay so that it seemed more natural, right? And then they could fool people because they weren't using tools like that. But again, all these data sets matter. And another anecdote from that same situation as an educator, and you're thinking about it, this again was in higher learning, and um, the student wrote an email asking for some flexibility because she was pregnant. And the another student wrote in the same semester, very large class, um, asking for some extensions because his wife was pregnant. And the AI responded to both of those. And in one of them, the artificial intelligence system responded to the, the, the man whose wife was pregnant and said, congratulations on your family's extension. And then continued with the rest of the um, decision. But for the woman who said she was pregnant, they didn't say congratulations on expanding here. What is that? So it turns out that the data that had been fed to the, the program, the learning, um, the machine learning, did not 
thing, but also extremely problematic. That screenshot actually I used for a case that I teach about neuroethics because that was done in China and it's an actually a company in Boston. So the, the company that makes them trialed it on 10,000 Chinese children and not American children because there are ethical, legal, social guidelines that make it impossible for them to do that testing here. So it's a responsible conduct of research issue. Now, that's not directly related to education specifically, but we have to be careful about how we approach these neurotechnologies. The talk here and the panel is not about neurotech, but that's an area that's near and dear to me. I am very quickly mentioning Institute of Neuroethics, I think, and Tank. Um, I am one of the founding members. I'm going to just show you our website very quickly if that's something that's interesting to you. But we do end up thinking about some um, artificial intelligence. Our goal at Institute of Neuroethics is to advance a future with ethical brain tech for everyone. It's a global think and do tank. So, of course, engaging in the Jamaican communities is an area that I'm really curious about and looking forward to. Our goal is to co create and promote ethical research and applications of neuroscience. Um, and we do this in a variety of ways. So, this isn't specifically on topic, but I definitely wanted to mention that. I'm going to stop now and um, I hope that I can address some any issues in, in questions. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks for all of you who are still here with us. And thank you very much, Dr. Gillian Hugh, for giving me an honorary PhD. Gillian, <laughs> uh, I'm a regular Mr. Christopher Record. I know F, Record, Record. Spoke about that. Anyway, folks, so I have been given the opportunity to speak about, it's, is it coming up? No, you're not picking up anything? All right, it was working before. Yeah, so, Elon, come again. All right, we're just doing a little technology uh, fix in here. Are we good now? All right, fine. When I came here this afternoon with my laptop bag, then I put it down, then I opened it, there was no laptop in my laptop bag. I sent a message to my wife at home and the laptop was sitting at my desk. I disconnected it from all my multiple monitors and everything, and it wasn't there. I took a deep breath, and I said, okay, Chris, you're a tech guy. You've been doing this for 40 years. How are you going to get your presentation here? And I smiled to myself. I said, Chris, cloud computing. All the technology you're using at home is connected to the cloud. I put up my phone, and bam, I had access to my phone. So I just said, okay, I need to borrow a laptop. And then I need to just log in, and then I need to just voila, and the presentation is here. I am explaining that because that is what we're talking about, adapting to the changing nature of the workplace. This is changing because had we not had cloud computing to help all of these massive new organizations to grow as fast as they're growing, we wouldn't hear about people like Airbnb or Uber or even Google because Google and Amazon, I mean Amazon, how can we forget Amazon, is actually one of the biggest cloud providers and that was not what their main business was about. They were selling stuff. This, you know, Amazon started selling books and then what happened is that after a while they realized that all the technologies that they are using, other people wanted to use and all of a sudden a massive new opportunity. So how do we move from disruption to opportunity? folks. Um, you know, I'm, I'm happy for the other presentations that went before. Tashfi and Ahmad spoke a lot about the history of AI. Um, AI, for those who probably missed that, the probably part, look folks, the concept of AI was created 70 years ago. 70. AI is not new. What's new is the amount of data that we have now available. And also what's new is generative AI. So when we just throw up the term AI, there's a whole bunch of definitions in between large lang language models, generative AI, and um, you know, there, 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 there's a lot of um, things in between that. If you're interested in the field, you should do, dig a little deeper. I, I like the fact that, um, that Mr. Ahmad mentioned Kai-Fu Lee. 
I just finished reading his book, one of his books, because Kai Fu has a lot of books, um, called AI Superpowers. A fascinating book, gives you the entire history, but also gives you a, a, a lot about the Chinese, um, the Chinese component of AI. So I do have it in my list. I have a list at the end of recommended reading, which um, Kai Fu Lee's book is in there. So I'm going to just talk about what happened in COVID. You see the screen? My slide says, everyone has a plan until they get punched in the mouth. And that was a quote that, was that has been attributed to Mike Tyson. I actually didn't do a deep dive to see if it actually he said it, but I've seen the quotes a thousand times and it always said that Mike Tyson said it. So I've been using this ever since COVID to talk about what happened during COVID. COVID presented a tremendous amount of opportunities to a lot of us, yes. Condolences to those who lost any loved ones uh, I had. Um, it, 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 it's another one of these things. I remember, you know, about 100 years ago, we had something very similar. There was another plague before that. Again, we didn't, we didn't have the medicines, it, but opportunities were presented because from that um, um, pandemic, we actually learned how to deal with this pandemic, which is why those who jumped on the gas quickly, the same exact thing with the technology, those who jumped on the gas quickly were able to continue operating and continue delivering products and services to their customers, continue to uh, manage good, relations to good relationships with their team members without any delay. Only some of us were able to do that. I'm very happy that my organization was a tech company at the time, still a tech company, I'm no longer running it, but we were able to, I mean, the most overrated, overused word in the pandemic was pivot. We were able to pivot, right? <laughs> and all of us, pivoted to work from home. So what didn't happen in three years happened in three months, right? Because everyone had to scramble and there was no excuses. There was nobody couldn't, well, no, no, no. All the long approval processes were out the window and we had to do things right now because the, the, the meeting had to happen right now. So that evolution of tech, a lot of things happened. Let me tell you something. I will speak. I, I look, I, I started life as an IT. I mean, yes, I was a teacher at first, but I started life as an IT guy. And, 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 and many of us have been putting proposals on the table to our, 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 our leadership teams and board of directors. And, and let me tell you something. Exactly. Forget it. Nothing was happening for years. Lots of justification. Where's the ROI? Where was the business case? And COVID reach? <laughs> Let me tell you, what never happened in <laughs> years happened in weeks and months, right? So this whole concept of the digital future is now. And what I want to talk about is some of the changes that some of the workplaces have gone through. I have a little case study to share. And if anyone remember a little concept that the government, in, in partnership with the private sector, created called ENDS. Anybody remember this thing called ENDS? All right, so we see a lot of bike people out there with these big things on their back that kind of came out of end sort of. We didn't create it, but it was uh, you know, a result of it. So what I'm going to talk about mainly is, is, is a research that founders of a, is not a real life university like Omicro is a university, right? It, but it's an it's a educational institution called Singularity University. And when you hear the term singularity, you know it's a play on some of this technology about us being one with the AI, right? And um, Mr. Ahmad made mention of that whole us making connection with the internet if we wanted to implant chips in our brain. And that's kind of one of the uh, concepts around some of those folks that talk about the singularity. So this organization called Singular Singularity University, um, its founder and a number of other private sector folks started studying exponential organizations. Why are some of those organizations so huge? Anybody knows the most, the most valuable company in the world now? Like right now, today, the most valuable company in the world is a technology company. And the second most valuable company in the world is a technology company. The third is an oil company. And then the fourth is a technology company, right? Now, what I find fascinating, and I don't mean to disrespect any of my, um, 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 how do I say it, my Caribbean brothers and sisters, whose companies are 100, 120, 150, 100, and almost 200 years old in Jamaica. These companies are like 30 years old and 40 years old that are worth not millions of US dollars, not billions of US dollars, but trillions of US dollars, right? So the number one company 
is Microsoft, believe it or not. And then after that is Apple, and then after that is a Saudi oil company, and then after that is, I think, is Meta. Did I write it down? Oh. After that is Alphabet. Alphabet owns Google, right? So, why am I saying all of this? These companies grew double, triple, quadruple digits faster than everybody else over the period of time that they were alive. And some people kind of wanted to start to find out why. Why are these guys growing so fast? And the type of people that they need to hire, who's coming from, you know, the education system, who, what, what resources are they looking for? Who is going in there to make that plane fly? We heard the concept of building, the, <laughs> building the, fl the plane while it's flying or building it while it's going on the runway. So these guys from Singularity University, Salim Ishmael, Dr. Peter Diamandis, and a whole bunch of other folks came together and they researched between 100 and 200 um, exponential organizations and they actually, found, they actually found some attributes. They found 11 key attributes that exponential organizations have. But before I get to attributes, one of the things we also found is that a lot of the exponential organizations were using a tremendous amount of exponential technology. And when I say exponential, though, you know, the exponential technology that, they, that, that they're using um, were, of course, what are we talking about today? AI, artificial intelligence, right? Um, it, it's, it's one of the many things, right? Robotics, 3D printing, um, VR, AR, virtual reality, augmented reality, um, blockchain, uh, networks. So a fair amount of this, art, of, of this exponential tech were being used in the companies that had exponential growth, right? So these, you know, reinventing business models and reinventing ecosystems. And the word ecosystem is going to come up two more times because I actually have a slide that talks about a business ecosystem. So using a lot of these technology, and, and, and to the teacher that was very passionate about it, I think that, yes, faster, cheaper, and, and, and reinvention is something that we really have to think about, especially, look, I'm a former teacher. I came out of um, the teaching system. I mean, I went to, I didn't come to Michael. The closest I came to Michael, I, went, I was next door. I was at Wilmers, right? And after I left Wilmers, I went to CAS. And then I did my teacher training at CAS. And then I went into the classroom. I taught. I taught electronics at uh, 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 Noah High School. It was a secondary school at the time. So I understand that passion when you, when you have these students in front of you. But what, what the world is now saying to us is that there's a different way that companies are growing. We used to have linear growth. And I'll just throw this in. This is just me thinking about it as I'm talking right now. And there's also linear learning, and there's a certain type of learning that goes on, right? But I think what's happening to us right now, um, Mr. Ahmad, and I think based upon some of the things that you're talking about and what Dr. Hugh was talking about a while ago, uh, we have to realize that we have to get into a new era of teaching and what to teach and, and, and the expectation coming out of this, um, these, these types of experiences. I... Because I've been talking a lot about AI, and you know, the government have, uh, has asked me to sit on this AI task force. Uh, I've sat up at UTEC because I used to go to CAS, which is now UTEC. I used to, I've been back up there speaking to a number of the lecturers around how they are using I am. Um, <laughs> and I better tell you the hands are serious in what UTEC anyway. <laughs> about um, how they are using AI. And when one professor explained his whole change, right, things that would normally take him weeks now take him hours to do. Then you realize how people, if you, if you stop fighting it and say, okay, I know that there's some risk. I understand that there's some risk. But right now, I can't sit down and, and ball over the spill milk. How am I going to maximize now? How am I going to use it to me, right? It's a new... So yesterday, um, an organization that I'm a part of, the Jamaica Technology and Digital Alliance, hosted a discussion around AI with a, with a leading um, AI developer. And one thing he said, stop thinking about AI as a tool and start thinking about AI as a new enabling technology. It's a new enabling capability. You have new capabilities. It's not just a tool that you're going to take up, use, put it down. No. How am I going to now take it and become a part of it? So, with exponential growth, 
as, as, as the diagram shows, uh, regular linear growth is, you know, 5 10% growth. But when things start to become exponential, as, as the local diagram says, is that a chaos or excitement going to happen right there? You choose. And yes, I heard some people are worried, right? But where are the opportunities, right? Somebody going to always worry, but other people, while you're worrying, are going to thrive massively out of this. I'm suggesting that you should choose the thrive angle and the excitement and amazement side instead of the worry and chaos side. There's enough people worrying. Let them go and worry, right? Now, what really happens in this, in this growth part of the trajectory? There's a picture, and it's, as I was sitting here listening, I said I should, I should have actually um, um, put it up. But I'm sure all the people who go on IG and Instagram and Snapchat or whatever technology tools use, you'd have seen, you'd have seen the photo of the person that has just holding the phone in their hand and said that there's a before and after. And the before, you see a table filled with a fax machine, camera, a boom box, uh, about 20 or 30 things that are every single solitary one of them are now all built in here for free, practically. Yes, you have to pay a lot for the phone, but if you added up all of that stuff versus what you pay for this, vast difference. You're practically getting it for free. Those who remember, I'm looking around, I don't see much gray hairs in the room, but those who remember when you had to take a picture, you take a bunch of pictures with your camera, then you have to go down to the development place and you hope and pray <laughs> so at least one or two of them come out good, right? And then you, one week later or two weeks later, you go back, you collect it, and you sit on a whole head and say, Lord Jesus, <laughs> right? And out of the 36 pictures, you have to pay for all of them, by the way. And when you get that back and you sit down and say, all right, at least I squeeze out one and two good. Imagine that compared to this. And every picture that we take now, and when I give my daughter my camera to take picture, my phone to take picture, you know, click, 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 it's about 50 pictures in a millisecond versus, you know, if I gave my stepmom or my grandma, click, <laughs> and everybody set up again and go, click. The kids, they don't care. They don't understand. This is free, right? So this is what happens when something becomes digitized. So the exponential growth, um, Peter Diamandis and, and Sally Mishmael in their book, um, Exponential Organizations 2.0, get it, read it, it's on my reading list at the end, speaks to that deception that happens when something is digitized and something is growing. So one of the case studies that they use is the, um, is the human sequencing of the human genome and how long it was going to take, and people were concerned, and people were worried, whereas some of these guys were looking at us and saying, no, I'm not worried, because it moving from 0.001 to 0.01, to point, it kept on doubling, doubling, doubling. So when you're, when, when you're taking 30 steps from here, I don't think we're going to reach the gate, but if we're taking 30 exponential steps, then we actually circle the globe more than once. So first step, number one, second step, two, next step, four, next step, eight, next step, 16. And if we keep on doubling, that's what happens with exponential growth. So I'm saying all of this to say that there are certain people using the right technologies, and AI is one of them, that they're going to exponentially grow. And you want to understand it so that you're in that pool, right? So, the, so, so the dis then the disruption happens. Disruption happens when nobody's not watching over there, and then all of a sudden, Boom, you have something called Airbnb. All of a sudden, you can go to a go country, go to a, 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 go on a trip, and instead of going through the regular hotel system, you can rent rooms from somebody, uh, or rent an extra room from somebody's house. I did it. I mean, I did it with my family. I've done it by myself. You just, you just try, I just was just experimenting with it because I wanted to experience it. And all of a sudden, you're disrupting an industry. If Airbnb has to have, have to add a thousand extra rooms versus Hilton adding a thousand extra rooms, think about it. One person just press a button on their computer and invite several more people to add their own bedrooms. Hilton, if I go buy land, 
I forgot to build a hotel. I forgot. Just, just think through all of that versus somebody who just presses a button. Boom, a thousand new rooms is added. That's exponential growth. Same thing with Uber. All of a sudden, you need to add, you own a taxi company, you want to add 20, 20 more cars or 100 more cars. You have to go to the bank, you have to borrow money, you have to go buy the cars versus Uber. Press a button. Need 100 new drivers who have cars at home that, uh, who have extra time. All of a sudden, they sign up, they press thing, they're validated, they're training. They're there within, within days, hours versus. So understand that is exponential growth. And there's a tons of more organizations out there and systems like this. So, these are the, 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 the 11 attributes that every exponential organization has at least four. I had a presentation that I went through each one of these in depth. When I was realized that I was given 20 minutes, I said, no way, Jose. I'm going to just bring up one slide and just high level speak about some of them, not even all of them. So the first thing, the first most important thing is that all of these big exponential growth organizations have a massively transformative purpose. It's not the mission, mi mission, vision. It's not the mission. It's bigger than that. Why am I here? What's my purpose? Right? What is Google's purpose? Anybody know it? Anyone? Anyone? Bueller? Bueller? Anyone? No? Anybody watch that movie? Anyone watch that movie? Oh, God. You guys are too young. Anyway, so... <laughs> Organize the world's information. You think that can ever finish? No? All right? So I went and I did my certification with the OpenEXO organization. That's what they call themselves. And um, I had to come up with my MTP. And you know, you can change it after several years. But you know, you start with something. And I say, you know what? I want to help to digitize Jamaica. I want to, I want to help to make Jamaica a digital society. I think that's a big, audacious purpose that I don't think I can finish in my lifetime, right? So that's why I end up now, I'm, I'm on the AI yeah, task force, I'm on another committee called the Digital Transformation Advisory Council that we advise the minister and the officer of the prime minister. I'm also on the Data Protection Oversight Committee, which administers the new um, Data Protection Act, things like that. So you said, okay, that's my purpose. Okay, how am I going to get this purpose done? And so you start doing some stuff. So. Ideas and scale. They have created some acronyms so people can remember. But again, by the book, Exponential Organization 2.0 is not my book. I didn't write it. Their book, great. Um, one is internal work that you have to do, and one is on the outside. So, for example, staff on demand. I gave two examples earlier, and both of them have, have, have staff on demand, where if you want to add a thousand new rooms for, for, for um, Airbnb, it's all external. You're actually not hiring anybody new. You're just turning on your system and your channels and allowing new people to come and start to use your system. You've created a platform, and they are now just using the platform to do what they're doing. Are we educating and teaching our students to learn and understand that stuff, that kind of all those factors that they have to understand? Crowd and community. Many organizations... And could I use this example? All right, let me use an example. So um, let me use a data protection example. So there's an organization, I won't call your name. I didn't get your permission this morning. I should have asked. But there's an organization that I'm coaching because I've helped and advised you know, businesses to become exponential. Because that's one of the things I'm, I'm trying to do. Let more people understand all of these factors. And I said to them, why do you think you need to hire all these people? Don't hire them. What you need to do is train them, empower them, so we're going to create a community. So all of these people want to learn about more about the Jamaica Data Protection Act. Some of them are IT people, some of them are lawyers, some of them are legal students. Let us build this community that they all, they all get trained by us. We help them and advise them. And then once we then do that, we then put them in groupings. And we said, okay, we have this customer that looks like they have some needs for us right now. You, you and you come together and we're going to now put you out there. I collect some of the money, you collect some of the money and we help that person. But I train you. So all of a sudden, we are build, we're, we're, cre we're creating a crowd that is using our platform. So what we need to create is a platform. So this is just an example of crowd and community. So they have, they have modified the next one that says algorithms and AI. How are we using these tools and technologies and measurement and software to help 
right, to help with, with our, and there's lots of examples of that a while ago, don't need to go through that. And of course, leverage assets, again, I don't need to buy a car, I don't need to get your room for Airbnb, it's yours, I'm just leveraging your asset. So what new businesses in this new ecosystem will happen where I'm just using, financiers been using other people's money for a very long time. They take your money, give you back a little interest on it, loan it to somebody else with a higher interest, and then that person builds something, maybe a hotel, right, or 10 houses for Airbnb, and then <laughs> pays them back, right, and then they pay you back a little bit less, right? But just to make a little more on the money, right? So that's so what leverage assets words, and of course, engagement, why is a computer doing that? So, so that's on the outside. Of course, on the inside, you know, experimentation, autonomy, social, dashboards, read the book, it explains it to you. Don't want to, you know, take too much time to go through it. But all I'm saying is that when the experiment and the research was done, anywhere between 100 to 200 companies that were all exponentially growing, in other words, their revenues were 10 x in, not no regular little 20% or 30%, all right? 10 times growth. They realized that they employed four to five of these attributes to make them grow. But the most important one that everybody had was a massively transformative process, right? In times of change, learners inherit the earth while the learned find themselves beautifully equipped to deal with a world that no longer exists. And this was written by philosopher Eric Hoffer in one of his books, I think, Future Shock, I think that, no, that's Toffler, right? Eric Hoffer, 1973, said this. There's not now we're talking about this kind of stuff, right? So I spoke about um, ecosystems. This again, and I like choosing quotes and cases from things that happened a long time just to show you that this kind of thinking is not brand new, right? I suggested a company to be viewed not as a member of a single industry, but as a part of an ecosystem. So I, this is a setup for a case study that I'm about to tell you. So the case study is using ENDS, right? <clears throat> ENDS stands for E-Commerce National Delivery System. What was ENDS? ENDS was created in 2020, let me see if I remember my, my dates. 2021, right? Between 20 and 2021, what happened? We're in the middle of the pandemic. We had lockdowns. We had, and by the way, we had it easier than some other countries. Some other countries were way stricter than us. The Prime Minister called the PSOJ and the Jamaica Chamber of Commerce and said, look folks, and JMEA also brought all the heads together and said, look, we need a solution. I mean, obviously, the administration know that they are going to do this thing. It is being called on by the various medical leaders globally. Let's, we, have to, we have to restrict the movement, so restrict the movement of the virus. That was a plan, right? So the prime minister was concerned about the small business people, right? Because he, he does understand, or the administration does understand, and when I say administration, I talk about everybody, both sides of the house. They all understand that you restrict movement the small man who makes your money daily is going to hurt. So the call from the Prime Minister was, all right, folks, how can you create something to let the small man continue to operate, but we can still lock down? So the example was, let's say, a chicken man out on the roadside, right? which is, by the way, the case study that we used first. We actually had a chicken man that we gave a cell phone device and we set him up with um, online payment so that he could collect money online, collect his order, and then a bike man was there waiting on him to deliver the chicken. So that was the first case study. So a case like that. Or if you happen to have a small restaurant or a cook shop, how do we set it up so that I know that you work at that cook shop and you have permission to go there? So what the system did, there was a... It was an ecosystem that we created, which <clears throat> about five agencies were involved because the police had to be involved, transport authority had to be involved, and you know, a number of these people had to be involved so that, so that we were saying, this company over here has permission to stay open late. And all of these five people that work there has permission to be on the road. And then the taxman who's carrying them there has permission to be on the road. So all of that had to be entered into a central system that when they get stopped and they produce your little hashtag, the police on his device snapped it, looked at it and said, green light, this person has permission. All that was created by a number of people. It was a public-private partnership between, is that lady okay? Okay. So it was a public-private partnership between a number, of, uh, a number of organizations and individuals. So we got the call, we had to meet with the, the PM and, and, and a number of ministers, 
and we had to present our ideas. And all of this happened within a, like a two-week period. We conceptualized the idea and we pulled in a whole bunch of stakeholders, right, public and private sector, to just. And again, we said, guys, we're not charging nobody nothing. We're not charging government nothing. We just just come and throw in. Let's just show that we can do this together. And that's what we did, right? So um, the PSOJ kind of led it. Um, the then president was PSOJ. I was the, the, the lead on the project in terms of just a communication lead mainly because the business folks were Lauren Peart. You may have heard his name, Blue Dot Insights. He does business analytics. He actually just did one of the, um, the surveys for the, for the party election. Sheldon Poe, Innovate 10X, and a host of other folks from, um, from EGOV, Jamaica, Simtai did some cybersecurity. Again, 10X was, was mentioned. We had, a, we had to hire a project manager for the coordinate everything, get there, add intelligence, uh, had a, had a, a, an, an analyst from, from PSOJ and an organization out of Trinidad, out of uh, Eastern Caribbean, I think it's Trinidad or Barbados, I think it's Trinidad, called WePay. So there's a whole bunch of people that got involved to create this ecosystem. So the ecosystem was created, um, the delivery system was, as was asked for us to, um, to, to, to think up, we created it, and then we were able to, during all the full lockdown days, the delivery people could be operating whilst uh, uh, keeping within the laws of what, was, of what was prescribed. So this is an example of this new type of, um, I'd call it, a new type of workplace where it's all remote, it was digitally enabled, so you ordered online, um, the payment was online for those who had a debit or credit card, and of course, you know, with all these things, you heard that somebody was doing something not too legal in the background, people are quietly collecting cash and delivering cash and giving back cash payments. That wasn't supposed to be part of the plan, but of course we are creative Jamaicans and we'll get around all these things. So there's a case that, um, <laughs> that happened. Um, the organization, the ENDS project, got special recognition at the RGR Glena Awards in 2020 um, for, you know, for the project. Uh, the e-commerce, the ENDS system, e-commerce national delivery uh, program kept over 6,000 persons in jobs. Um, 500 business operated, and it was, uh, you know, it, it creates a significant boom and the growth of the delivery industry as we know it. And that was that happened here with just partnerships, with just calling people and say, let's do this, let's create this new thing. So this is kind of one of the things that we did. So closing, um, Alvin I've, I've Tuffle of Future Shock. This is the other one. The illiterate of the 21st century will not be those who cannot read and write, will be those who cannot learn, unlearn, and relearn. Very important. It is something that this is what I preach and talk about regularly. Unlearn, relearn, reskill. Technology converts scarcity into abundance. Right? Right? In one of the books that, um, that Peter Diamandis wrote, actually, the book is titled Abundance, and it shows how the understanding of that technology that we're fearing creates abundance. Massively important. Do not close your mind to it. Yes, understand the pros and cons, as you know, Mr. Wang had, had brought out, but do not close your mind to it. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. These are the recommendations that I have. I mentioned a book by Kai Fuli that um, Mr. Ahmad had mentioned. Scary Smart, Exponential 2.0, mentioned that several times. The future is faster than you think. And of course, I have to recommend my own book because I actually did some research. I wrote a book about digital transformation. So thank you very much. Open to all the questions now. Wow. I was just sitting there and I said to myself, I feel that we're all fired up and ready to move on with artificial intelligence. Am I correct? All right. There is still some fear. No, I don't know how many persons can see this picture. It's Nokia 3310. I had one. I still have it. You remember this phone? This was a coveted cell phone, you know, that allowed us to feel like we had, you know? Arrived. Yes, that's the word. I loved my Nokia 3310. But how many persons would still walk around with this when you have a smartphone that can do so much more? Some persons say this because of the durability of the of the Nokia 3310. It fell, it, everything happened to it and nothing happened to it. Absolutely. And so the point I'm trying to make is that as we evolve, we have to 
understand the risk, but also, as was pointed out to us by Mr. Record in his presentation, that there are so many opportunities. Oppor the sky's the limit. When uh, Mr. Ahmad made his presentation about prompt engineer and what they were being paid, I did the calculation. I can't finish spending off this money in my lifetime. 3.7 million per month. Jamaican money man, me do the conversion, you know, because I'm going to be a prompt engineer in Jamaica. Me not leave in Jamaica. Jamaica sweet, right? But 3.7 per month. All right, and I'm working from home. So there are opportunities. So I, I understand the fear, but we also have to take account the opportunities. I also want to make mention of something that was shared by Dr. Hugh in her presentation. The reality is we can use technology advantageously as educators. Gone are the days when we give quiz for everything. We have to make the assignments meaningful. That's what I took from it. I'm so fired up as an educator. We have to make the assignments so meaningful that students cannot go to chat GPT and complete the assignment. You have to do a case study. You have to get involved. We have to create the kind of pragmatic environment that is necessary for learning to happen. I know you have questions, but I am so fired up and excited, and I know you are excited as well. So I'll accommodate two questions, and then we're going to invite Dr. Morris to do our vote of thanks for us. Questions or comments? Somebody just tell me, say you're fired up as well, please. <laughs> Can we take a question from online? Do we have any online questions? No? All right, so we're going to ask Miss Unter. She is all the way in Dubai, and she is going to share with us. So we'll, we'll allow... Mrs. Hunter to go ahead. Yes, she's on screen. Hi, good afternoon or good evening, I think it's there now. Um, uh, the presentations and everything from all the, the other speakers um, have been absolutely excellent. Um, there's a couple of points that I would just like to um, kind of raise, and it's in terms of, um, again, in terms of employment, um, and um, it was talking, you know, in terms of, yes, with this um, AI, um, there will be kind of like a, maybe a reduction in employment. Now, the thing that's quite good, and if you think of commerce, and for me, the reason why I'm um, excited about this is because, effectively, even if there's less jobs, somebody has to put money in my hand in order for me to spend, because that's how business works. So where I am here, where we have, where people have been using the tools, what the government here has done is encourage business to reduce people's working hours. So people are going to four day weeks, three and a half day week for the same pay. So I think that this is something that people need to look. So effectively, we will be could be getting the same, but doing less. Because with these type of things, it doesn't work. Business doesn't work unless people have money to spend. So they have to find ways in which, so that, that one of the ways is to reduce people's working hours, and of course there's ways to kind of find new occupations. So the, the kind of model that they have here is give us more free time, and that will give us more time to go to the malls, go to the cinemas, and basically enjoy general entertainment, which is a business in itself. So those business areas are um, increasing and improving um, as a result of people having more free time. With it also water? means that people have more time with their families, and that that's a kind of another thing that's really important. Um, yeah. So I think that yes. particularly um, in Jamaica, this is something that they need to think about in terms of, um, one, companies that will be reducing but still making lots of profit 
how do you tax these companies and how do you get money from these people so that one you can put it back into your you know into into your kind of infrastructure into yours in order to make sure that the money's going round um, because this is a this is the one of the issues with this uh, with the kind of like generative AI um, so again money for funding for education and to make sure that it kind of you've got that kind of spin um, and then the last point um, I wanted to kind of make is again uh, for not just Jamaica but where we have um, lots of people uh, maybe, maybe leaving countries in order to find work elsewhere there will be less jobs elsewhere so effectively just to make sure um, you know so for here we have lots of people from Philippines with people from with people from all over the world where where I live um, only 14 percent of the population actually are kind of Emiratis everybody else all of us are all um, immigrant workers we're all expats we all come here to work and has the um, roles decreased um, we will then need to go back home or go back to you know um, or they will not be bringing in so many people and so it's to look at if you don't have so many people leaving what will they be doing in your in your own countries so I think that they're, they're the kind of two things that I would kind of, they're more questions than kind of answers um, that need to be thought of in kind of the bigger picture um, also as a team as a company um, who are looking to implement, we implement AI tools, I work in a broadcast and um, the last point I'll make, because uh, I know that uh, people are probably tired, is um, what I've found is our kind of KPIs on this um, technology is much less than people at the moment, so I think that this has been raised by some of the other speakers, so whereas we would have a capability where we were looking for KPIs at 99.998% being kind of like considered a failure. Where we're using AI solutions, they're accepting 95% as kind of like a KPI. Um, and, it's, and we're hoping that, you know, this will prove. So we, I think that we are far away from it being kind of, you know, perfect at the moment. And we are having to lessen um, our quality measures in order to incorporate some of these tools. Um, so they're the few things that I wanted to kind of say. Um. All right, thank you. Thank you so very much. And that's interesting. It's, it's good food for thought because if we're thinking about the exponential growth that you mentioned, we have to stop to consider quality assurance mechanisms to make sure that we are providing uh, good service, good products at, at all costs. All right? Very, very important. Thank you so much. We're also going to invite DeMario to share with us. He is going to be sharing about uh, possibly some AI classes that are available and if there is a cost for it, and we will take that information now. Thank you, thank you. Uh, this has been a great panel today. Um, I would like to thank personally all of the speakers that have really kind of laid it out. Um, you know, with, um, what I was going to bring to the table today, I was going to share some information around AI. But I do believe that a lot of these topics have been covered. So if you don't mind, I would just like to talk to you personally from an aspect of artificial intelligence. I'm Demario McElwain, CEO of Skilldoor, which is the first AI instructor-led platform in the U.S. and the first globally to have AI instructor-led courses accredited in the world. And what that means for you is we are components. We really love AI. Now, um, to, uh, I think it was Mr. Wong, as he's still in the audience, he said something earlier about the spiritual implementation, implementations of, of utilizing AI. I want to just kind of share that I actually wrote a book 
around that various topic called AI is not God. And the reason I wrote the book is because many people fear the word AI. But I believe that the word AI is a broad term. And I believe if we kind of focus on educating ourselves and understanding what does that mean, we will be a little bit at ease. And also I like to say to teachers and leaders, um, through learning about AI, um, we're not just focusing on ourselves and our mindsets. We're thinking about the, the, the next generation behind because it is here. It's taken over. And to me, personally, I believe that this is a technology gap that will happen within our community. And therefore, we need to at least educate ourselves in understanding its uses so we can educate others on ethical and practical uses of AI to help, you know, increase the workforce. With that, one of the passions that we have is, is providing training around the introduction of AI essentials. We have an AI essentials course, which covers mainly about everything that you heard today, but in bite-sized bits to where you could understand it. And what we want to offer your community is the ability I'm sorry, I'm just reading the chat. We just want to offer the community the ability to take our online course. And with that, I will provide Dr. Leon with some information on this course, as well as I just want to empower everybody that's stayed here today um, to at least take the course to understand it. And then from there, make your own assessment on how you want to disseminate it to those that you teach and, and you're working in, your know, work that you have involving um, in the community at, at this moment in time. Oops, excuse me, I was reading the text. But um, with that, I will close out because I know it's getting late and, and I'm probably dragging myself. So thank you for letting me share this moment. Thank you so much, Demario, for sharing with us. And certainly, the information that you sent to MOSA will be disseminated in our community. I'm going to invite at this time Dr. Morris to come and to do our vote of thanks. Thank you so much for staying the course. And I know that you are fired up about this technology and that you will leave this evening committed to do some research. As Mr. Record said, uh, learn. What did he say again? You're asking? Learn, unlearn, and relearn. All right? There's so much for us to learn and to empower ourselves um, in these new normal, we call it, times. Thank you so much. It was good being your moderator. Dr. Morris? Thank you very much. Okay, quite a long evening. <laughs> good evening, or oh, good night, ladies and gentlemen. Um, this in, is indeed an evening of, we used to say, enough matter. <laughs> so, um, we wish to thank our presenters and our moderator for taking us through the AI journey that has allayed fears, but has also increased concerns for many. Such is the world where changes are taking place, but the key is adaptability. As one of the presenters said, there is no reason to fear. AI is not going, going away, so we have to educate ourselves and use the tools available in the AI sphere to remain relevant. And you said reskilling is necessary. <laughs> Concerns on ethics are valid, but if rigorous policies are put in place, then it gives some consistency and can provide a level of trust. So colleagues, the AI field is massive, it's transformative, and can be beneficial. So the thing is, don't get left behind. So thanks to our audience and, and those online um, for being so attentive and intentional. Thanks to our sponsors and our supporters. Thanks to the Michael for their collaboration and being accommodating for some late requests. Thanks to the technical team 
for adjusting to the late needs that we had today. Um, thanks to our administrative staff. They have been working hard all week, uh, well, for the last month and a half to prepare for, for these events. Um, again, thanks to our students who stay the course. I know some had to leave because of um, classes. So thank you very much for being here with us and helping us along these ladies here with our online um, help. Um, again, thanks to the Michael community for making this evening possible. Remember to check out our activities for the next two days, please. And thanks again, and be safe for those traveling home, for those going back upstairs or across there. Continue to work tonight, get up in the morning. We meet again tomorrow morning at nine o'clock here. All right, so thank you also very much.